All right, team. Hey, good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, the meeting starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at about 23 minutes. 23 minutes the meeting starts. Uh, we'll get some music going now as we wait. But uh, what do you guys think is going to happen here? Bullish or bearish on the Fed list? And speak to me. You know, market's down to 366 right now. You can see the queue uh, all the way down to 274. Yeah, we're going to do a poll, as we always do. Poll are very good on the poll right now. And the speech starts in about 23 minutes. I've never felt more bearish. All right, guys. All right. So, yeah, the speech goes live in about 22 minutes. 22 minutes. We're going to send out our newsletter here. Y'all be sure to join our newsletter. Uh, BeginnerTrading.net slash members. Be a part of it. We're growing our newsletter quickly got a uh, almost 400 people part of this newsletter so hey y'all join it we're gonna send that newsletter out it's completely free doesn't cost a penny and uh yeah let's let's get ready we're gonna stream the entire conference here we've already in, we're already in the weight room for the fed listens um again 2 p.m eastern standard time is when it starts and we're gonna stream it all getting put in the poll if you have time we're also gonna do a twitter poll Market's still coming back down here. Let's see if it actually holds. Again, hit the like button while you're here. We cover all the major economic releases, news, all that good stuff, as we always do. I'm ready to send the newsletter out. Market's starting to break down. You can see the Q down to 274s. You can see the SPY down to 365.70s. Uh, so this speech is called the Fed Listens uh, speech. This is specific. Uh, let me let me go, give you a little rundown on what this is. Um, It is called Transitioning to a Post-Pandemic Economy. Uh, they're going to be hosting a Fed Listens event today, convening, this is what they have in their description, convening representatives from a range of sectors, sharing perspectives on how the pandemic has reshaped the economy and the workforce and what challenges and opportunities exist during the transition to a post-pandemic economy. Jerome Powell is going to provide the opening remarks and Leonard, or Leo Brainerd, I'm sorry, and government Governor Bonin is going to moderate conversations with leaders from organizations that include nonprofits, small business, manufacturing, supply chain management, hospitality, and more. Uh, it's going to be a series of discussions as part of the Fed Listens initiatives and aims to engage a wide range of stakeholders to hear how the economy is progressing across the U.S. Um, so yeah, it's a, basically it's a, it's a press comment. It's a, it is a conference from the Fed will probably influence the market to a certain extent. Uh, the meeting is in 19 minutes, Andres.
Yeah, market's falling here. Again, vote on the poll. Let me know what you guys think. Hit the like button while you're here. We're going to stream the entire thing live as we do. Market bouncing up a little bit short term, almost up to 366. Again, press conference is going to start in about two, uh, at 2 p.m., about 18 minutes. Yeah, maybe, Frank. A bunch of people from different sectors about to tell us how trash the economy is. Hey, maybe. Maybe, brother. I don't know. We'll see. Do we still count the market as oversold if the stocks keep dropping more and more? Well, it's all relative to the time frame. You know, um, I think long term, we're oversold right now. But short term, as I've said a bunch of times, I have no idea what we're looking at short term. You know, market might keep falling here. I think Disney is cheap under 100 bucks, though, for me personally. So I'm, I'm starting to scale into that. Uh, but that's the only real one I'm scaling. And I also have 15 shares of Snapchat at 1020s, but break even basically on that right now. Uh, but yeah, as for long term, I'm starting to buy up stuff at this point in time. But, you know, uh, market continues to fall. So short term, there might be more pain. It just depends on how patient you can be. Uh, I think if you're patient enough, you'll probably end green if you start buying stuff down here. But maybe not. Maybe I'm wildly wrong and maybe market just keeps crashing and never resumes back to these levels and maybe that's you know gonna happen i have no idea i'm not an investment professional here we're just kind of speculating and uh yeah we'll see Green day for me today. Again, this is my profit graph today. Uh, this is my graph. Uh, this week's graph. No losing days total. Uh, this is the entire combine so far. So we're doing pretty solid. And this is pulled directly from my platform, so not really fakeable. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we get this green stuff to continue. Uh, speech starts in about 15 minutes, almost exactly 15 minutes. Again, let me know if you guys are taking profit into this or what you guys are doing here. Let me go ahead and post this to Discord as well. What happens when one losing day loss on top step? It's just a losing day. I've lost on it so far. Like these are my this is my entire time so far. I'm up about a thousand after today. I'd say probably about eleven hundred to a thousand uh, so far. Uh, at, before today, I was up uh, nine hundred. You can see that here. Uh, but these are my days so far trying it. Uh, first day we made 212. Next day we lost 67. Next day we made 380. Next day we made almost 300. Next day we lost 190. Next yesterday we made 260s, and then today we made about 280 or so. Let me see, something like that. Uh, yeah, we made about 280 today, so we're getting there. 
Bye, bye, bye. Yeah, I mean, I tend to be a bull uh, in all this with, with all this stuff going on. I tend to see value. But again, I also think it depends on how patient you can be. You know, some people need their profits now. Like if you're short term trading, I have enough equity to where I can hold long term if I need to. And I think the people who are going to lose the most are people that panic sell in these moments. Uh, I think that even if this is a crash, historically, we usually rebound within a couple of years of every almost every major economic crash we've had over the last half a century. And so in that regard, I think that the people that lose the most are people that are going to be panic selling. And I'm starting to buy stuff up down here um, with the understanding that things might keep tanking, like stuff might keep dropping. What I'm buying right now is Disney specifically, because I think Disney is diversified enough to be OK. But again, I'm not sure. Not sure. Disney might just crash down to 80s or something. I really have no idea. Uh, but I'm starting to kind of average into longer term positions here because I think, you know, Warren Buffett, fearful when others are greedy, greedy when others are fearful. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, I trade the ES. I trade the regular E-mini. Laugh. Uh, what I do is I build up a cushion. And then after I build up that cushion, like if you look at this here, my mentality is very simple. Um, you can see this here, right? So even today, let's look at today. Today's the best example. So I trade the micros until I build up a cushion of about a hundred bucks. So you can see I build up a small cushion, build up a small cushion. Once I build up a profit of about a hundred bucks, you can see how much this angle, how sharp this angle is after that, which is me macking, uh, with this, which is me scaling up to macros after that. So I trade small until I build up a cushion, and then once I have that cushion, I scale up to macros, and that's when I start swinging a little bit heavier. And that's why you can see this shoots up from a hundred to almost three hundred when I started trading the macros. But that way, if I say say I lost right here when I was up a hundred bucks, right, I lose back here, I'm back to break even. I'm not down, and then I scale back down to micros and rinse and repeat that, and then eventually, me scaling up is going to stick, and I'm going to make money with larger size, and you know, like I did today. And that's a way you can kind of trade with small risk, but safe, somewhat safely. It's never completely safe, of course, but it's it's to a certain extent safer than if I just kind of went directly trading macros, uh, swinging for the fences. Don't you trade crypto, bro? Do you have a reason? Not for what? I trade crypto sometimes. All right, guys, we got 10 minutes here, 10 minutes. All right, guys. So again, we got we started about nine minutes, team. Nine minutes. At least three hundred point up. We're moving the Nasdaq. I hope so, bro. Like like I said, uh, we're gonna stream the Powell speech right here, Tyler. So we'll be we'll be streaming it right here, brother. Uh, uh, so yeah, is Bitcoin back up? I mean, look. So Bitcoin at 18.7K. Again, speech starts in eight minutes, team. Eight minutes.
All right, guys. So again, we got about seven minutes. All right, guys. So, yeah, hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. We got about six minutes here. Uh, we're going to be streaming the entire thing live right here, guys. So be sure to subscribe. We cover all the big major economic data. Um... All right, guys. So again, Q down to 274.20s here. You think VTI is a good hold to weather storm? Seven minutes, uh, about five minutes now. Yeah, we'll see. Vibe. <laughs> again, y'all hit that subscribe button, guys. Yeah, everybody hit the hit the like button. Um, again, guys, we we cover all the major economic releases: FOMC, CPI, PPI, jobless claims, retail sales, unemployment. Uh, Fed meetings, all that stuff. We cover it all. Hit the subscribe button if you want to watch it live. Watch the stock market reaction to it. We'll be streaming here. Everybody do me a favor here, man. Listen, if y'all appreciate me covering these, these streams, I really want my crypto channel, our crypto channel, me and Cam's crypto channel to hit a thousand subscribers. And so listen, we got 500 people here. If just 70 of you guys subscribe to the crypto channel, we will hit a thousand subscribers. Super helpful. Y'all go do it now. We do have a crypto channel. Let me know what you guys think. There's the link in chat. Uh, it is youtube.com slash beginner crypto. We are trying to grow that now. Hit the subscribe button. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's pump that channel up. Dogs are good, man. Uh, the new dog's back in my mom's house. We kind of trained her a little bit and then put her back in my mom's house. Uh, we're, we got a lot of stuff going on here uh, at my house to where we had to... My mom has her again. Um, which She's my mom's dog, so... But, uh... Uh, but... Yeah, right now, they're we're, we're getting our entire bathroom renovated. Uh, they found black mold in our bathroom, and so they're renovating our bathroom completely... Uh, because of that, we're kind of upstairs in my house, um, and we just don't, you know, uh, we don't have room to take care of two dogs and one in our upstairs, you know, so it would just be tough, um, you know, so my mom has her again, but we still have Rosie. Hey, thank you guys, appreciate you guys. Uh, what's up, Slope? Uh, hey, well, everything we do here is free, guys. We don't, we don't charge a penny for any of our content. We just kind of put out free stock market information. We cover CPI, PPI, jobless claims, FOMC. Uh, Fed minutes. Uh, Fed minutes should be in a couple weeks. Um, we cover Fed listens, speeches. We cover all this stuff. So, hey, subscribe. Hit the notification bell. We appreciate you guys. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, we're looking at the poll here, we got about 400 plus votes. 44% uh, are bullish, 56% are bearish. Are you a bull or bear? Well, I'm cautiously optimistic here. You know, I'm, I'm starting to buy stuff up down here, so I would like us to go up, but I certainly don't know for sure. And uh, I certainly understand that the market could just keep tanking, especially if he says something hawkish or bearish during this meeting. You know, of course, the market could just continue to fall. I understand that we are in a time of uh, aggressive rate hikes and high inflation. And so in that regard, you know, I think that um, it's certainly possible that we keep dropping. But again, I think over time we'll rebound from where we are now. And uh, in that way, I think that, you know, I'm not I'm not too bearish. I understand we could keep dropping, though, to be honest. So, you know, we'll see. Basically, I'm neutral. Favorite crypto, uh, ETH, probably. I think ETH has the most potential uh, over everything, including Bitcoin. Bitcoin might have started the crypto movement, but I think ETH is going to take it to the next level. I think it's just the most interesting one. Uh, there's a lot of altcoins that are interesting as well. VeChain, you know, XRP, all that stuff. Pretty, pretty interesting. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, man. You know how it goes. Slope. Everybody wants to be an expert. I just, I don't claim to be. I'm just, I'd rather give free stock market information, you know, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Nobody can get mad at me because I'm not claiming to really know, you know, I, I, there's just too many gurus selling courses on publicly available content. I'd rather just put everything out there for free. Um, I post affiliate links and I have sponsors and stuff. So I certainly make money doing this. Um, I'm not going to be too self-righteous about it, but, uh, but yeah, in order to sleep better and justify that, uh, we just kind of put everything out there for free. Bull run. Is it a Q&A? So Powell was actually doing the opening remarks, and then there's a lot of people following up on, on those remarks. Um, I trade a few different ways here. Uh, lately, I have been trading here. Let me get let me get everything ready here. So we are we are kind of getting everything ready. Uh, I'm gonna mute the background music for a second so I can get the link for the Fed Reserve. All right, so we're in the wait room for the Fed listens. Um, yeah, we're in the weight room. We're just kind of hit sitting back here. Starts in about a minute, but yeah, we trade a $30,000 TOS account. We trade on top step, which is a funded account program for futures where they give you a demo. You can hit their target on the demo to follow their rules. If you want to check them out, here's the link for that. Uh, that's one of the affiliate links that we post. Uh, but aside from that, you know, we just kind of trade the $30,000, you know, we, we trade futures, we trade stocks. I'll pin that to the top of the page. If anybody wants to check it out, meeting starting pretty soon, uh, specifically in about 30 seconds. Hopefully he says some good bullish things, but who knows, man. Yeah, I wish, I hope the market does well. Hey, what's up, Daniel? All right, guys. Let's see what this says. All right, we're live in the Fed Minutes report. We're going to wait for them. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon. Welcome. It's a long time of, uh, of uh, virtual events. It's also, uh, I'll point out, this is the first time we've had a full board of governors in nine years. So this is to have the seven of us here. It's the first time we've done a meeting like this in seven years. So in uh, nine years. So. It's terrific. Um, so these these sessions started just a few years ago in 2019 in what turned out to be a very different time. They were valuable then, and we've continued to benefit from them as we've navigated the pandemic shutdown and the path to recovery. So we started with listening sessions around the country that brought together people and organizations representing businesses, low and moderate income communities, workforce development enterprises, employee groups and unions, community colleges, retirees and many others. We wanted to hear directly how our monetary policy decisions were affecting people's daily lives. So then the pandemic comes and upends everything, the way we work, live, learn, and conduct business. And we kept these conversations around Fed listens going. And we thought we gained valuable insight, which continues to help guide our policy decisions. And I also think we, you know, we delivered good transparency about how the Fed works to the American people through this process as well. So these events have now become a permanent fixture, fixture of our broader outreach. And my colleagues and I remember, I'm sure we remember each one of these events that we've been part of. They're really the real life embodiment of, of, uh, of, of our policies and the way they affect uh, the, the people that we serve. And they do inform our thinking as policymakers. So we continue to deal with an exceptionally unusual economic set of disruptions as policymakers were committed to using our tools to help see the economy through what has been a uniquely challenging period. The insights you share in these events help us to home in on the challenges and opportunities that are shaping what we might think of as the new normal of the American economy and it'll inform us as we try to get there. So my colleagues and I are very happy to hear from our participants today to host those of you who are tuning in to listen and to do the work that we do on behalf of all Americans. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Bowman, please. Thank you, Chair Powell. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm so pleased to be here with you all today in person to moderate today's discussion. And I just wanna express my thanks to all of you for your willingness to travel to Washington, D.C. to be with us here today for this uh, Fed Listens event. Over the past year, we've held a dozen Fed Listens events across the country hosted by our reserve banks. 
And we found these conversations to be a very valuable resource for us as policymakers. Hearing directly from people in different communities about how you are experiencing the economy helps provide important context for the economic data that we consider. These dis discussions help us develop a richer understanding of how economic conditions are impacting people in their businesses and everyday lives. And it helps us think about how we can best achieve stability and support for the economic well being of all American families. Today and in other Fed Listens events over the coming year, our intent is to shift the focus of discussion toward understanding how the pandemic experience has reshaped the economy and the workforce, and the challenges and opportunities that we will face during the transition to the post pandemic economy. So, with that, let me turn to our first set of panelists who bring with them direct knowledge and experience of how the economic landscape is evolving for U.S. businesses. They represent organizations that include small businesses, manufacturing, supply chain management, and the hospitality industry. I know that all of you have experienced firsthand the extreme economic and financial hardships brought on by the pandemic. And during the re economic recovery that has followed, you've likely also seen rapid and substantial changes in supply and demand conditions in your industries and in the communities where you live and work. Given those lived experiences as business leaders, we are especially looking forward to hearing each of your perspectives. And as we hear from each of you, I'd like to invite my colleagues to follow up with any questions that they may have. So let's start with our first panelist. I'll introduce Tom Henning. Tom, thank you so much for being here with us today. Tom is the CEO of Catchway Distributing, a wholesale distributor of food products for convenience stores and food service establishments in the Midwest and the Great Plains region. Cashway began in 1934, delivering candy to local grocery stores in Kearney, Nebraska, and the company now manages an inventory of over 20,000 products. Cashway has remained privately held by the Henning family, with the second and third generation family members involved in the business today. So Tom, for our first question, could you please describe how the pandemic changed the demand for transportation and warehouse services? And to what extent are shortages of material and labor still affecting your business and industry? Thank you. Uh, the pandemic changed the demand for transportation and logistic services in some manners that were expected and some that were unexpected. After the pandemic, we expected a fair amount of pent up de demand that would be released. And it was. In fact, uh, probably the demand that existed out there was greater than what it was pre pandemic. Uh, but what wasn't expected next before the pandemic hit was the number, the demand for workers would exceed the supply by a larger margin than what existed pre-pandemic. Uh, the size of the workforce became much smaller than it was pre-pandemic. We also believe that many left the workforce and for a variety of reasons. And uh, we were wrong on that too. We really thought uh, the workforce would, uh, would grow. There was a sh shortage of truck drivers and warehouse workers prior to the pandemic, which uh, the pandemic further exacerbated. The shortage of truck di drivers before the pandemic was estimated at 61,000 drivers. Today, the estimated shortage uh, is in excess of 80,000 drivers. Uh, the shortage of drivers was an issue then, and it'll be a much bigger issue now. And the prediction is it will be an issue in the future. Uh, We've seen some estimates that the shortage will double by the year 2020. And to give you an idea of the size of the driving force that is out there, uh, the universe of truck drivers today is 1.53 million drivers. So you take, you know, a 5% shortage, a 6, 7% shortage, I mean, it's gonna be significant out there. As a re result, the cost of labor has increased significantly for everyone in the supply chain. With the supply of labor down, the competition for drivers heated up immensely. There was an extreme amount of pressure on the transportation and log logistics side. 
and still is and probably will continue to be for uh, the foreseeable future. In order to attract and retain drivers, uh, our company raised our wage rate three times in 2022 uh, so far. In 2019, we gave all our employees free health care. Uh, and then we gave all our drivers and warehouse workers retention bonuses. If they stayed with us to the end of the year, they would get a bonus paid out on the 30th of January. And that did much to solidify the workforce. Then there were the supply chain issues. Uh, and the shortages of products we sell every day from our su supply chain vendors was significant and still exists at a high, high degree today. Prior to the pandemic, and we measure our inbound fill rates from our vendors every week. We have a number of metrics that we utilize every week. Our inbound fill rate from our vendors was 99.2%. So for every 100 items that we would get in or we would order, we'd get 99.2 in. Our inbound fill rates uh, right after the pandemic started dropped down to about 55, 60%. By December of 2020, it was up to 90%. And in 2021, we had a pretty good start and then it dropped to 78 to 80%. And this year it uh, was probably in the 80% range, 82% range. And for the last 10 weeks, it has been running 90%, which is good news. Uh, we changed our inventory philosophies uh, because we had many customers out there that depended on us for products. So we started loading up our inventories. We used uh, the popular inventory philosophy of JIT, just in time. And then we changed it to JIC, which is just in case. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we're over we're over inventory, but those people need products. A restaurant who has got an event planned for Friday night and you make a delivery Thursday and the product isn't there, he's in trouble. And it's all, our business is all about customer service. As a rule today, most of the time, we don't know what we're gonna receive from the vendor, uh, and which is kind of unusual. There are many challenges for the vendor community out there. A lot of it has to do with raw materials. They have labor problems also. They've got priorities on certain lines that they're producing. And uh, so anyway, most of the time, we don't know what we're not going to get uh, until the truck unloads, or we might have a call from that vendor, which is a switch from the norm. Uh, and the timing of deliveries is probably not as great as it was pre-pandemic. Since the pandemic began, our vendors have eliminated over 900 items that we no longer have. Uh, and especially uh, in the convenience line, uh, that's where we, where we really notice it. You know, between wages, worker shortages, the price of fuel, and the supply, supply chain challenges, our costs have really, really skyrocketed. We believe and have gone through our numbers and look at the inflation numbers. We've looked at, uh, we look at our inbound freight rates, understanding that we get probably our products from growers, from shippers, from manufacturers. So they have freight into their establishments and their freight costs have increased. We have got freight from their establishments to our warehouse, and then we've got charges, uh, freight charges basically that are built into our pricing to our customers. I, and we've been trying to calculate what percentage of the food inflation is relative to transportation and logistics. And we've got kind of a consensus between all of us that probably 38, to 45% of the food inflation that we're feeling right now is become a 
because of logistics and transportation. It could be greater. It could be greater than that. Uh, we do a cost index report on our total uh, on our total product mix, and we do that every week. Uh, we started doing that about twenty five years ago, and uh, because obviously you've got to have you've got to have you've got to have growth, and you've got to have organic growth. And the difference between the growth you're realizing every week and and inflation is basically organic growth. So our cost index report, and I've got numbers from, I think since 19, uh, since 2020, uh, indicate where, where we've been, the path we've been on. Uh, this last week, our inflation rate was probably the lowest it's been in, I'm gonna guess, probably four or five months. It was down to 10.3%. Uh, but yet, compare that to what the inflation rate was the same week, a year prior. Our total inflation from 2021 is probably 22, 23% in that range. So we're, we're, seeing some, we're seeing some drop there along the line. We're also seeing some softness in the marketplace, which, uh, you know, probably is indicative of why the inflation rate uh, is uh, lower. On the other side of the coin, we still have we still have increases coming through. We're still struggling with product shortages and labor. Uh, product shortages are occurring for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the big factors that's going to have an impact on inflation, probably yet this year and probably next year, is the drought we've been experiencing. Uh, I can tell you right now, and we hear this from the potato growers, we've seen the price on what we call baker's potatoes uh, double in the last couple of weeks. And this last year, the potato growers in the Idaho area, which is really the prime country for growing the kind of potatoes of uh, a food service establishment likes to have, they knew they weren't going to get water. So instead of planting potatoes, they planted wheat. And uh, so now there's, there's going to be plenty of wheat that comes out of there, but the potatoes are going to be thin. There's an extreme drought that's hit in California. And California is a big producer of food that we consume. Uh, one of the products we're not going to have this year is going to be pears. I remember in 2012 when the drought hit, uh, and we, we sell a large number of school districts. We imported uh, fruit, fruit mix. Uh, we imported peaches from Israel. And Israel has, uh, uh, and that was probably the only place, uh, you know, some of those products were available. So we may be in that, in that same boat here down the road. Tomatoes are, are a little bit on short supply. Uh, the other thing that's happening, uh, we're in the, in the corn belt of uh, the country along with Iowa and Illinois. And we've had a lot of drought there. We're finally starting to get some rain. Uh, one of the things that happened last year, and you read about this and you heard about it, the price of, because of the war in Ukraine, the price of fertilizer, nitrogen, potash, and uh, phosphorus just went off the charts. Uh, nitrogen went from like $200 uh, a ton up to 930. Uh, I know for a fact there were many farmers out there that were doing a balancing act. How much less of this can we use and still grow a crop? And what does that add to my cost? So my guess is going to be that we might find our production of maybe corn and soybeans maybe down a little bit this year. And depending on what happens next year and the experience factors they've got there may, you know, have an impact on whatever uh, some of the commodity prices are. A uh, beautiful part uh, in our area of the country is that the cattle market is good and we're starting to get a little bit of rain now. But if you look around the world, you go into South America, you go into China, you go into Europe, and it seems like every continent is having their share of, uh, of drought. And so this might be a factor of all uh, in the future for uh, food production and especially the near future. That's just a personal opinion. 
Labor is still an issue. Uh, the driver pool is still far from being adequate. We have a driving force of 250 uh, individuals and we have positions we work to fill every week. There was, there was a time during the pandemic we were short times we were short 20 and 30 drivers. We have one supervisor for every 10 drivers and, and they drove all year. They drove vacation routes, time off for other drivers and, uh, and, and the like. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn that on. <laughs> now if I can find it. I've all been there. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Interesting ringtone. <laughs> uh, Maybe to our second question, which is about what your business outlook for, for next year. I was just and, gonna get into that. Okay, great. <laughs> and what, what other challenging issues might be facing and expecting uh, to face? You know, our business outlook for next year is good. I wouldn't say it's great. Uh, first off, we're, we sell commodities. Our company was founded in 1934, and that was during tough times. It was founded in 1934, and uh, the products we sell are really, in a sense, recession-proof. Uh, they're they're uh, people have got to eat, so we're looking for we're looking for probably a fairly decent year. Uh, on the other side of the coin, there's going to be casualties in the in the marketplace, and uh, we could have some short-term challenges out there. And the way we're dealing with that is uh, interesting. We're working with we're working programs right now to keep our customers profitable, and uh, and we're reaching out there because uh, I mean they're the lifeblood of the organization. And I think during the recession in the '80s, there were a lot of folks that didn't have a lifeline. Communication wasn't great, so we're reaching out to those folks now. Uh, we need to see them through this. Thing. Uh, and it's not a matter of extending them more credit. It's not a matter of uh, making, give them, giving them some type of stimulus along the line. It's helping them better manage their business, make it more profitable. Uh, so that's going to be uh, that's going to be one of the challenging issues we have. The other challenging issue we really have, and this is critical, if there's a, I think there's rough. I can't tell you exactly. There's over 2 billion trucks in this country. Uh, we have not been able to upgrade our rolling stock, uh, our rolling uh, uh, stock for probably two years. We have 250 tractors. We have 400 trailers that uh, we need to make the deliveries. Uh, we haven't been able to acquire a new tractor since November of 2019. We typically replace 10% of our fleet every year. Uh, the last tractors that we purchased in November of 2019 cost $106,000 and it's pretty much a standard, uh, standard product that we buy. We've got five coming next, next week. They're $165,000 a tractor, 40% increase. Uh, plus uh, we've got to pick slots now. We'll have, we're, guaranteed kind of halfway of having probably 20 tractors. We really need 50. We're guaranteed to have 20 tractors in 2023. So we're going to, we're going to spend probably five, six, seven years getting things caught up in our fleet. Uh, the cost of the cost of uh, putting trucks on the road today is uh, very significant. It's gone up right around $80,000. $80, so that's going to have an impact on transportation total. And when you look at the number of trucks in the country, uh, and the options aren't great. We had a number of trucks sit this last year for seven, eight days because we didn't have microchips. They were 2017, 18 models. Uh, the parts availability, tires uh, is one, one big thing. On trailers, insulation, we had trailers we ordered two years ago that we finally got in the first part of this year. Those went up 40%. So 40% sounds like probably an average uh, 
cost increase that we're going to see with uh, rolling stock uh, for you know any operation out there. So I think I'm getting down to the end. Tell me, how does that um, how does that inflation and cost for these necessary replacement items? How does that impact your your outlook for going forward or changes to how you prioritize expenses in other areas? One thing about it, you got to have the cash flow to do it, and you've got to have. Uh, so that will be the challenge in you know developing a, a plan, a business plan, which which we will, which we will do. Uh, I think in our company is sound and solid. I, I don't see a problem there, but I do look at other companies in the industry and I think they will have some challenges there along that line. And there's some options out there that they can certainly use, but it's, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, we, we spend more money today on just uh, uh, just maintenance, uh, you know, a vehicle gets so old and you have a problem. The other thing we need to do that's gonna be important is we need to get the manufacturing of a lot of those component parts back here in this country. And I could give you a list of things that we have to source outside of our country that put us really in somewhat of a predicament when it keep, uh, comes to keeping your trucks on the road. Thank you. We'll probably follow up with you to, to learn a little bit more about that. But I'd like to ask my colleagues if they have a question. Yeah, just a um, couple, one narrow, one broad. The first question is, are you able to pass these costs along? You obviously have been hit by, you know, costs right across the board. And the second thing is really, um, do, you, do you feel like we're getting through this process? That There was enormous disruption to your business and many others, and all these cost increases and shortages and everything. Do you feel like and I guess there's not that much progress with the drivers, but do you feel like we're getting back to a better place with the suppliers and the customers yet? Or is there a sense of progress? I think there is a sense of progress. We're making the move. And I think the moves you make are extremely important. And I think that'll get us in the right, uh, right, in, in the right direction and applaud you for it. Uh, uh, I do think that, uh, I do think that we're moving maybe a little faster than what I thought in terms of uh, the, the economy and everything. Uh, and uh, so, no, I, I, I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. Uh, it, we might be, the only thing I'm not confident in, uh, I remember when they, when the pandemic hit us, they said, oh, in 30, 45 or 60 days, things will be back to normal. I think what we're encountering right now is going to take a period of normalcy. Uh, it's going to be probably two, three years off, four years off, maybe. We've got to get caught up. It's not going to happen overnight. And on costs, you've been able to pass those right along? Since yeah, are, yeah, we have. Yeah. And the dollars we work with are large enough. If uh, yeah, and, and the customers really don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. We can't, we can't lock in old pricing unless they've got contracts somewhere out there, we can't lock that in. And so they end up having to pay it. They're so voluminous right now that part of the problem is you don't know what the cost is. If you ask me what the cost of eggs were, I could tell you probably in a few minutes because someone just told me what they were paying here a little bit ago. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's fast and furious. So despite uh, higher prices, demand is still there. Man demand is, is demand is still there, and I suppose it's a question of the amount of money that uh, is still floating out there, uh, you know, in the economy. The the bad thing is it's going to be the lower income people that really take a beat, beating. And we've you know anyone that's in production, if they're in sales, if they're in uh, in manufacturing, whatever the case is, their uh, their salaries have kept up, drivers and everything. But we've got we've got a layer of people out there that uh, haven't had a lot of haven't had a lot of opportunities for increases. In fact, right now, one of the things we are doing is taking everyone that hasn't had an increase and figure out how we can give them one and how we can give them one that's substantial enough. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be a challenge, probably for everyone down the road. 
Thank you very much, Tom. We appreciate um, your perspectives. And um, we'll move on then to our second Thank panelist, Chidi Kumar. Chidi is the chef and owner of Garland, a restaurant and performing arts space in Raleigh, North Carolina. Chidi is a self-taught cook who studied recipes while pursuing a career as a guitarist in several rock bands. She was a semifinalist for the James Beard Awards Best Chef in the Southeast from 2017 to 2019 and was a finalist for the award in each of the past two years. Chidi participated in our board Fed Listens event last year and where she shared compelling stories about the challenges that she faced running a restaurant business during the pandemic and in the early recovery period. Chidi, thanks so much for being here with us in person this year so we could actually meet you face to face um, so that you can share also your perspectives on how things have changed since last year. So our first question for you is about how your business has changed actually since we spoke last year. How does customer demand now compare to what it looked like before the pandemic? And have you seen changes in dining patterns that you think could be long lasting? Thank you, Governor Broman, and uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so our uh, restaurant, music venue, bar complex um, is uh, one building that we have been paying rent on uh, since 2010, um, and we closed our doors at the end of August. Um, so, you know, there were many, dis many factors leading to that decision, um, and most of them are really, you know, um, I, I want to say at the outset that you know, I'm a restaurant owner, I'm a chef, and we're working on a new project. Uh, I am speaking for um, my from my perspective as an independent restaurant owner. Restaurants are ubiquitous. Um, you can eat at a fast food chain. You can eat at a, a, a fine dining chain that's in airports and hotels all over the country. Their perspective is going to be very different than mine, and I almost wish that we had a different name for our sector of the uh, industry because our challenges are unique and uh, the way we approach those challenges are very different um, because the math is very different. Um, so for us, uh, so many factors led us to decide to close our doors. And the main thing is that, um, you know, dining patterns have changed. Our, um, our restaurant has been located in a city center of a very small city. We're the capital of North Carolina. Um, and we're surrounded by government buildings and, you know, law offices, uh, a lot of tech companies, um, architects, you know, small, small firms of that nature. Uh, we relied on presence in, in, the, in that aura, you know, um, people would come to lunch and whether they ate with us or not, they were aware that we were there. Um, there was a mostly, you know, professional white collar workers. Um, well, they didn't work downtown anymore and uh, they discovered new eating habits they cooked more at home they got uh, food from csa's farmers which is awesome uh, they discovered their neighborhood restaurants and um, they just approached dining out differently and they didn't maybe want to make a trek downtown and struggle to find parking and navigate construction that has been ongoing. Construction has not slowed down from my perspective. Uh, in fact, things take longer to, to build. And I know this because we're building out a space right now for our new project. So uh, the project starts and then you wait two months for uh, an electrical, uh, you know, a little breaker switch or whatever, two months. Um, or for a meter base, which are just nowhere to be found, or copper, or whatever it is. Um, so we're not the only downtown that has a lot of construction just sort of dragging on and on. And that doesn't really invite people to come to your restaurant, right? Um, I go to Nashville, and I see the streets are dug up for years, and there's a restaurant right behind that. You know, it's very easy for people to say, let's just go somewhere else. Um, and they discover a new spot and they go there, you know, and there's, uh, there are a lot of options when it comes to dining out and, and dinner and how you approach your food for your family and for yourself. So we're very cognizant of that. And that's a very mercurial kind of situation. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, all restaurants, I think, were faced with decisions on how to pivot, you know, that, that the P word that keeps rearing its head. Uh, and so we all tried things that were completely outside of our normal way of operating. Fine dining restaurants started doing meal kits and takeout. And so you could get, you know, maybe you were mailing something from Goldbelly 
So we're doing things that are completely different for us. We're not built out for these kind of operations, but we did them. And so you start thinking about different ways to operate and the consumer is kind of connecting with you in a different way. Um, so things are still really much, very much in flux. Um, I don't think that we've settled into what an independent restaurant looks like and what this industry looks like. And I don't think that we're gonna get there for another three to four years. But in this meantime, um, you know, people who have one or two shops uh, can't really sustain this much change and these many losses for that long. If I had a hundred shops, you know, making a very small profit or very small loss, you're kind of, it's an aggregate. You're looking at the health of your total business. But for us, um, several weeks or several months of, you know, what are pretty big losses for us, um, very difficult to navigate. So we're, you know, we're trying to, uh, within our footprint, within the, uh, the menu that we are known for, within the type of service that we do, the way our dining room operates, the how many people we need to work in the kitchen, how many people we need to prep, how many people we need to get a guest from the door to you know, the table, and then what happens after they, they place their order, and all of those little steps. Restaurants are basically dependent on a series of re repetitive steps, and all of those are very time sensitive. There's no malleability, there's no work from home, there's no take your time. Um, because if the guest has a bad experience, they'll, they'll blossom forever, right? And if you don't know that that's happening, because as an owner operator, you're also working, uh, you're not, you're no longer just overseeing, you're washing dishes and you're cooking and you're prepping and uh, hosting and bartending. And we've done all, my husband and I have done all of these things many times over the last two years. You're going to miss that little, those details and that kind of all these little cuts kind of cut down your business and they cut down the level in which you really want to be operating at and um, that the guests, you know, expect. And that's not to say that we, you know, I think we did a really good job, but it's, a, you know, it's exhausting. We're, we're two, two people, we're a family operation and um, places like ours, uh, you know, our staffing situation has been just like uh, Mr. Henning alluded. It's, it's always a difficult industry to staff, um, but now it feels impossible sometimes. Um, I do feel like it's getting a little bit better, but um, you know we've lost a lot of our young um, people who we might have considered as career uh, hospitalitarians. Um, they, they maybe want to get a job in tech sales or go back to school or maybe become a nurse. Um, well, that would be an ideal way to go, but... Uh, you know, we, we can't really compete with those kind of benefits. We can't compete with not working at night. We can't compete with work from home. We, you know, we can only offer so much paid time off. Um, and that demand kind of gets sucked in by, or, you know, completely obliterated by people getting COVID. And, you know, so from the start of the pandemic until this May of 2022, we had maybe three people with COVID. And between May and August, probably 80% of our staff had COVID at, at one point or another, myself included. And we are very careful. We test all the time with masks and everything. So, you know, the way the pandemic is uh, affecting day-to-day -day life isn't as data-driven as it is now. It's just a reality, right? So if a cook is out for seven to 10 days, I mean, in, in 2019, they'll be like, you can't do that. That's unheard of. Like, what do you have, you know, the measles, like what? Um, that never happened. But now we have to sort of think about how many people we need with those contingencies built in. But yet the cost of each person's hourly wage is, you know, 15, 20% higher. Uh, our revenue is unpredictable um, because of the way our demographic in our part of the city is. Um, and if there's a variant that was raging, that's more, that, that was more of a, an issue maybe last year when it was, now it's just everybody gets COVID all the time, it seems like. So it's not this like wildfire that, you know, ebbs and flows, but we've had to sustain the losses throughout that time. So, um, so we have our labor costs going up and then, you know, uh, your question, um, Chairman Powell was, can you pass that? increase costs down to the customer. Well, we're the customer. We're the, we're the end game. 
And we can only raise our prices so much. So, you know, when you go to a restaurant, everybody goes to a restaurant and they see uh, a chicken dish or a pasta, an entree that maybe previously in a, in a nice restaurant was $28. Well, now it's maybe 34, but you're not going to pay 45 for it. I mean, you're just going to say, that's insane. I can make that at home. And, you know, you think you can. <laughs> some things you can and some things it may not be quite as good, but it's still dinner and you're going to still survive, you know. Um, so there's, you know, there's sort of this like uh, we, we reach a ceiling of not being able to have anywhere to push those costs for us down. So, you know, we see fuel surcharges on our invoices from deliveries. And um, again, as an independent restaurant, I'm a chef operator. I make creative decisions anyway about how I cook, what I put on my menu. I work with a, a, a lot of small farmers, but they're leaving too. You know, they're, they're getting tech jobs and web design jobs because it's, it's hard for them to find somebody to help uh, harvest their crops and bring them to us. And, you know, they're, it's a small operation. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not... I'm not sure if that directly answers exactly your question, but there are so many factors that go into a very just simple decision on where am I going to have dinner tonight, and uh, it's everything from your your location, what happens in your neighborhood, where do you live, what's around you, uh, how much are you prioritizing supporting local, uh, are you feeding a family, or are you you know a, a young couple with disposable income. Uh, you know, who is able to operate? Is the restaurant that you normally go to able to have all of their sections open? Or did four of the seven servers that they have call out today? And so you still have to open, but you can only <clears throat> sacrifice so much of what you can and can't do. You can't say, hi, welcome to our restaurant. We have three of the nine items from this first section available today, and two of the entrees are available. I'm so sorry. You'd be like, oh, what is this? Like, I'm never coming back here. But re in reality, I wish, I wish we could do that, you know, um, because sometimes you just really have to say, can we open or not? Well, thank you so much for, for your um, excellent answer to the first question. It was so good. You answered my second question, which was <laughs> about inflation. Um, so if there's anything you would like to, to talk a little bit more about, you talked about wage inflation, but the input inflation, you talked about how you can't pass it along. Are there other concerns? And I would like to open it up to my colleagues, too. I have a quick thing to add. I think real estate is such an important component of, um, of small brick-and-mortar places. Uh, you know, real estate has been thriving and growing and booming, and that's great. Uh, but uh, developments are happening everywhere in every city in, in, in the country. And, uh, you know, the, the starting rent is a certain amount. Um, so... As you know, in, the, in previous times, 30% of your uh, revenue food costs, 30% labor, and then you have your operating expenses, blah, blah, blah. Now, labor is hovering around 48, 50%. Your food costs have gone up to 35. So there's 75% credit card processing fees keep going up three and a half to 4% off the top. Rent is now, you know, I mean, where does it fit? You just, the, after a point, you, you get to 100% and you haven't paid all your bills, and so now you're operating at a loss. So, you know, for us, we were fortunate enough to be able to buy a building, and that kind of changes everything, but that's, we're lucky. You know, we, we um, utilized an SBA program and worked with a local bank, and, you know, we've been in business for a dozen years. We have a, we have a presence in our city. But that's not the case for everybody, and that's not accessible for everybody. So, you know, rent uh, rent going up and everything else going up and uh, the ability of a small independent restaurateur who has a dream and a vision and really wants to invest in their neighborhood, they may or may not be able to do that in the future. So thank you for that presentation. Just have a quick question. You said that this was a performance and performance space and restaurant. Most of the conditions you talked about had to do with the restaurant business. Are the conditions the same for, it seems like they would even be worse during COVID for a performance space. They absolutely are. We never actually reopened the performance space um, mm -hmm. once the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And our, our space is very small. It's 250 people. Um, so, you know, that, A, it just wasn't safe for so long. Um, all the ba touring bands canceled their tours. And... Because we're a small space, we 
really book small bands and they're either on their way up or on their way down. That's where we get them. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's expensive to tour. Gas is up, you know, uh, hotels are expensive. Uh, it's maybe not safe. Your record came out, you know, you're not selling records anymore. Everything is digital. So the, all of that math has changed. Um, you know, maybe people have gone to see their favorite band in an amphitheater. That math is totally different. So small uh, performance venues, I mean, that's just, that's really hard. You know, you can't really sustain that kind of business 365 days a year with local bands. You just can't do it. Governor Jefferson has the... Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question around the your strategy towards your workforce. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you <clears throat> had a team in your prior business that's closed down and now you're transitioning to a new project. Is your strategy to um, try to retain those workers that you are familiar with such that if you're thinking about the economic impact, there's some possibility that those people might be redeployed in, in your context? Or is what you're doing now so different that it really is the case that these are workers that were released into the economy, they have to find other uh, engagements and things of that sort? Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, we we did retain some folks for a really long time. I mean, we we've had some staff uh, that was with us for six years, and but then most of them were in the last nine months. Um, we offered uh, two weeks severance to everybody, you know, that we paid after we closed. Uh, we offered, you know, an open door. It, please come back and work with us in the and. Uh, when we reopen, we have a, a couple of people that we retain and going to pay through this transition. So, you know, I, it would be a very different situation and the, and the timeline and how all of that worked would be different if I didn't know. And uh, that most of my team could go and get another job. And in fact, I really helped to place a lot of people with a new job with restaurants that I, I like and <laughs> that I know, you know, operate with integrity and pay their staff well and treat their staff well. Um, if it had been a different time, we probably would have, you know, said we're closing in two months and it would have been a lot slower, but I know that most people can find a job very easily, but even still, we, we gave them enough time to find that work, be paid, and then help them find another position. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks everyone for all of your excellent sure. questions. We'll um, move on to our third panelist, Jess Pettit. Just as a senior vice president of commercial strategy, insights, and analytics at Hilton, a leading global hospitality company with a portfolio of 18 brands comprising 7,000 properties and 1.1 million rooms in 122 countries and territories. It's a pretty big role. So in, his, in your role at Hilton, Just delivers customer performance and economic insights to Hilton's leadership teams and partners. Just leads the only fully cross-functional global analytics team in the. Are oh, the sirens area. intentional or like Covering what's going brands, on here? Digital call center, new hotel development, and other key corporate disciplines. Just is a born and raised hotelier and has committed his career to his passion, the impact that hospitality has on society. So, Just, we'd like to hear a little bit about how this past summer uh, has uh, impacted your business and and hotel occupancy rates um, during. Compared to during the pand pandemic, and then um, where were those customers coming from? Was it for recreation, business, conferences? First off, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's truly a privilege, and thank you for all you all do for on behalf of all of us. It's an interesting economy between uh, Chidi and I, and you know the large and small business. Although I'd say um, many of the same dynamics exist, and and what we're uh, we're seeing from a hospitality industry perspective, and, and I, I I struggle to imagine an industry that that was dealt as, as difficult to blow during the pandemic, you know, 80% down plus in, in, in the depths of it. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a challenge, but also, you know, I think at least on the positive side for, for hospitality on our end, um, you know, starting to see that real recovery. And it starts with leisure travel, um, to, to your question. Uh, over the course of this, this summer, but also last summer, our industry shifted much more towards a, a leisure focus. It ties very closely towards uh, disposable income, uh, you know, stimulus, folks had uh, to, uh, more money to, to spend on travel. So, you know, complete opposite of, of 2020, the dynamic in 2021 summer and 2022 was this concept of revenge travel. 
right? You hadn't, you had not seen your families. Uh, you haven't seen your friends. You haven't been able to go to the national parks or, or see much of the country. And so revenge travel was a very real thing for us. And, and we see that dynamic in leisure markets. So you know, beach markets, Southeast US, you see that dynamic in um, uh, national park markets. You see it in, in uh, uh, long weekends, uh, the holidays, we become much more compressed from a, a, a business demand perspective. And so um, over the course of the summer, we saw our demand from leisure travel. So when you account for all seasonality and all the other noise up 10% versus 2019, right? And, and that's overall from an industry perspective, um, which is great. But then you realize that there's another 50 or 60% of our business, which comes from business travel and group travel, right? And and in order for our industry to truly have the compression it needs to be successful for our independent owners, uh, is is you, you need all three parts of that that, uh, that three-legged stool to to truly really be successful. So, what have we seen over the course of this summer? Right. So, leisure was doing very well. We started to see the initial signs of corporate travel coming back. Um, you know, starting the beginning of this year, corporate travel was down closer to 25, 30 percent. Now, through the summer, we're getting closer to that 10 percent down range. Group travel, obviously, for all the reasons you talk about events, all the reasons that group was the most depressed from a from a demand perspective, uh, we we saw that in our industry, down roughly 35% in the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, we expect that full year number to be closer to 15, 16% uh, percent down from an industry perspective. So you're seeing the recovery, and it's very much as we would have predicted it um, back in, in April of, of, of 2020. We built our first models and and we said the first thing that was going to be coming back was essential travel, what Tom talked about earlier, the, the folks that we needed to travel across the country. Then we saw leisure travel, small businesses which needed to travel in, in order to be successful. And we saw a bit of a, uh, an air pocket there um, before we saw large companies coming back and, and then finally larger groups. Um, I think you know the other dynamic we see, and I, I often use this story from, from my own experience, uh, you know, weddings and events, right? Um, we went from nobody being able to do that in 2020. I was meant to get married in 2020, first in June, then in September, then in June of 2021, and then finally in September of 2021. And the dynamic you see is, is there's compression, right? Everybody had that same experience. So I went from a Saturday at one venue to a Sunday at another, right? And, and so that's a, a very similar sort of pattern that we've seen cutting across. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I think right, maybe prevent babies as well. <laughs> so, so. Uh, which, yes, uh, I have a, a, a 10 week old at home now. Um, uh, hopefully, he's awake watching this. Um, so, yeah, we, we've seen some of those, those, those dynamics from a, a, the rest of the market come back. And so, it's not just been about leisure periods. As we get into September, we're seeing some signs of life um, in, in all segments. But by the end of the year, we're still going to be down overall demand for our industry around 5%. And that's when you take into account. Leisure up 10 and then everything else a little bit lower. And so what does that mean? Um, I'll, I'll jump a little bit to how that impacts price, right? Because we similarly are downstream from a price perspective, right? We're impacted by labor. We're impacted by uh, food costs, uh, um, a variety of other um, supply chain related things. When you know we look at our price on a year over year basis, I'm sure folks see it if they're traveling, you could see prices that are up 20, 25%. Um, on the whole, our, our industry forecast prices are around 15% um, year over year. Um, but when you account for, for um, inflation over a three-year period, so comparing to 2019, our real uh, average daily rate, we're still lagging 2019 levels. And, and it's really because of that lack of compression from all of the market segments coming back together, right? And, and so um, I think that's going to be the interesting thing to, to watch is as you know, we hopefully see demand reach uh, uh, levels across all customer segments, um, then, then, then price would, would follow in a similar way. Do you think that the uh, pandemic experience has reshaped the way the industry operates? Yeah, and, and so I think a, a couple of things that I would talk about there, and, and it kind of alludes also to the last question, there is a, a tale of two cities, right? And it's interesting because you see uh, resort markets, drive-in destinations, they have been doing quite well. Uh, extended stay hotels have done really well in uh, Tom's market and, and other markets like that. They, they've really supported uh, extended stay uh, travel. What we haven't seen is really the return to urban markets and large conventions, right? 
those are the lifeblood of, of major cities, right? And so we're starting to see that recovery, right? But there's obviously pandemic risks and other things that folks have been considering. Uh, you know, you need that overall return to desire of travel. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see that come back. And, and, and so Las Vegas and Orlando, we're starting to see that sort of turn back up. Markets like San Francisco, um, Chicago, New York, not as much, right? And, and San Francisco, obviously, much more dependent on the tech market, which has been quite, you know, different than the rest of the overall business community. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of, of, of that. I, I also, I like to think about sort of the, where do we want to get back to normal versus what's going to be a new normal that we expect, right? Back to normal is return to normal segmentation. You know, folks are able to, to have their social weddings in advance, get back to, to regular meetings, um, you know, normal travel patterns, right? The students being back in school matter to us, right? Because we, you know, people tend to follow the school vacation schedule. So as we see that come back to some form of normalcy, we're starting to see normal travel patterns come back. From a new normal perspective, there's a couple of things, right? We're seeing the emergence of what we call workations, right? The idea that people can work from anywhere. Right. So I'm not sure if that's the case for, for you guys, but in many cases, folks are saying, hey, I can not be in the office for a week. And what we used to call leisure travel. Right. You know, I had a conference in Las Vegas. I'm going to stay there for a couple of days and stay over for the weekend and all that is actually something broader. Right. We, we start to see some return to a, a, a new customer dynamic where they want to have a larger room um, and and uh, and stay in, in a place that they can, you know, work during the day and, you know, connected to the internet and all that good stuff. But then at night, um, they can do all the things they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um, doesn't impact all customer segments. Obviously, those with families still have to follow uh, regular school schedules. Um, hybrid meetings are, are interesting, right? I understand you guys were doing this in a remote fashion, right? We need folks to get together like this. We're not sure what the future of a meeting like this where half the tables uh, uh, over television and half is, is in the room. Um, you know, that, that, that's an emerging potential trend that, uh, um, you know, is, we're, we're going to all have to, to figure out, right? It's, everybody's been on conference calls where it's extremely uncomfortable, where you're the one who's not in the room and everybody else is. So we, we've, uh, we've got to figure that out, but that will lead to some sort of new normal. Um, and then the last thing I'll just call out um, on, on the sort of new normal is uh, of emphasis on digital tools, right? So for us, that's, you know, folks will trying to skip the front desk, right? That there's a little bit of a different model in how you engage with people in a COVID type world, which means you want your, you know, your key on your phone, whether you're flying or you're in a, a hotel room. So we've had a, a heavy emphasis on that in our business, but we're seeing that as sort of a change in customer dynamics, which undoubtedly could shift sort of the labor model where, where hopefully team members are able to do focus more on service as opposed to transactions. Um, transactions can be handled more digitally. Um, and then just touching on labor, uh, you know, similarly, as, as, as Judy said, our, our industry has been hit dramatically from a labor perspective. Um, we're still 400,000 jobs less than, than where we were um, from an accommodation sector. Um, we see it in all of our hotels. And when you think a demand environment where on the weekends you're busy and during the week you're not, right, that's a difficult thing to labor schedule around, right? And, and you don't get the consistency of scheduling that our team members uh, uh, demand and, and expect. Uh, we're also seeing, you know, the inflation of wages in our industry broadly double what is the broader wage inflation. So typically in the 12 plus percent range we've seen across, you know, across sectors and in in, in, uh, across regions in the U.S. Um, so we're seeing some some shifts in dynamics from, from that perspective. You know, Governor Cook has a question. Yeah, please. The data that, thank you for the presentation. The data that you're presenting are for the U.S. or are they global? U.S. Okay. Yeah, although we see similar trends. I mean, it's such that it interests you. We, we do see similar trends uh, outside the U.S. One interesting dynamic is, take Europe as an example, it's so much more dependent on cross-border travel, right? And so obviously that was more depressed when cross-border travel was more of a challenge. Here we didn't have as much of that. But major U.S. cities, right, the lack of international travel into New York or San Francisco has certainly uh, played a, an impact on demand. And taste preferences? I'm sorry? Taste preferences, and taste same, same, same kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, generally we see that. I mean, focus on the U.S. from a customer perspective, but yeah, we see those sort of trends. I, I would say obviously there there are countries where it is quite different. Um, China obviously is a different sort of customer uh, environment. But yeah, I think Mr. Had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the labor uh, question. So you know, if you look at where employment is actually down relative to pre-pandemic, 1.4 million in in-person services, it's 
heavily in leisure and hospitality in your yeah. sector. Is that because people aren't coming back to that sector, or is it because your demand is down and so you're not you're not uh, demanding the same level of yeah. employees? I, I, I um, it's undoubtedly a mixture of all things, right? And, and and as somebody who grew up working in hotels and is passionate about uh, that that sort of you know service economy that that we we had, um, it's you know, in some ways can be less enticing of a job in a COVID type world, right? You know, essentially they were essential workers having to be face to face in ways that, you know, us in corporate office world, we're not necessarily having to do. Um, so I think there's an element of that, which is, you know, um, we need sort of a, a mind shift back um, to, to where we were and, and the value in face to face experiences. Um, when I think about uh, what we're trying to do from an employment perspective, um, it's it's hard to get people to come back to work, so I think it's a little less of the um, our demand uh, um, uh, uh, isn't isn't requiring as many folks coming back. I mean, right now, it's, as I said, we're we're close to you know five percent down from a demand perspective, so not massively for that level of of, uh, of job um, displacement. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So Thank you. Ask just a related <laughs> question. So recently, I was talking to a large firm and yeah. Uh, Leisure hospitality. They were talking related to what uh, Governor Brainerd just said that their turnover rates, job turnover rates, had doubled than pre pandemic. That even when you can get workers, you can't keep them. Is that something you're seeing in all these areas? I'm sure we would see something very similar. We're all competing for the same subset of folks that it's a smaller pie that we're all competing for, right? So you see certain places where folks are putting out big bonuses to try to convince people to come their direction, and we have to all you know go back and forth. And so um, you know, the, the, the pie of workers in, in our industry broadly is just not wide enough. So regardless of what we do for demand, you're still going to have demand for labor. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's the case. Well, just thank you so much and congratulations. We hope you're getting some sleep. I <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate you being here with us. Um, our fourth panelist is Kara Walton. She's a director at Harbor Results, which is based in Southfield, Michigan. Kara leads the company's manufacturing intelligence business, which collects and analyzes millions of data points from thousands of manufacturing companies in North America. Harbor Results collects data from more than 600 privately held small and medium-sized manufacturers each year. Kara and the team at Harbor Results utilize these data and information to help small to medium-sized manufacturers improve their competitiveness in the marketplace. Kara also studies economic, business, trade, and tariff trends impacting the manufacturing industry. And she consults with clients on their business impacts. So Kara, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, can you help us understand what your most pressing concerns are for the small and medium-sized manufacturing businesses that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. First off, thank you everyone. It's an honor to be here. I really do appreciate it. Um, as you said, right, we work with the small and medium-sized manufacturing base. We're also a small business. We have about 15 people total on staff, so we're, we're quite small. Um, but beyond working with those small to medium-sized individuals, generally they're all less than $500 million. Some of them are $5 million companies in a year, and some are 700, right? But generally speaking, they're under that range. We did the math in our organization to give all of you a sense. It's about $30 billion in an annual year. That was incorrect. And it's $30 billion annually um, in terms of total output that they're putting out in the market. So to give you a sense of what they're looking at. They're privately held. They're not consumer facing. So they're supplying to a tier one or to an automaker, or an appliance maker. Um, and they're generally not unionized. So these are very, they're small and they're family owned, right? Sometimes we have second and third generation leaders. Our team took some time to kind of come up with an answer to this question. And we broke it into two core facets. Um, their biggest challenge from our perspective is labor. And we'll talk about that one a little bit. And then their second biggest challenge is the ability to make money. Um, so if I could start with the labor piece, frankly, there are many facets to it, all of which I cannot answer here, or else we might be here for a while, as I'm sure similar to you guys, um, but I'll do my best to give you a high-level explanation. So the number one core challenge that our people have is that they can't find people, number one, and more specifically, they can't keep them. Um, so in some cases, they are absolutely getting people into the door, and then they're not sticking around. This goes far beyond production workers. Um, so I absolutely do have clients who have challenges where Frankly, sometimes Starbucks or we're in Michigan, so the Tim Hortons or something like that will say, we'll give you a $1,000 signing bonus. We absolutely have companies who are losing employees to that, but it's also a skilled labor challenge. So we're lacking skilled labor. We're lacking people willing to even go into apprenticeship programs, and we're lacking office staff. 
one of the things that you guys talked about was that you don't have the ability to do work from home, nor do these people. At the end of the day, they have to make pieces and parts, um, so they don't have that capability similar to a tech world either. I want to be clear about one thing as we kind of talk about the labor challenge. At our core as a business, we focus on making sure that the only answer isn't adding people. We want our businesses to be efficient and to be productive, but they truly can't even find enough people to be efficient today, which is the big problem. Um, anecdotally, I was talking to a plastics processor this morning that hired 14 people last week. Three of them showed up this past Monday. One of them left at lunch. So, <laughs> and, and this is and this is not a this is not the only person who says this, right? I hear these stories and our team hears these stories all the time. Um, so one of the things that we really see right, is despite all of these businesses offering really high paying jobs and offering career development tracks and offering, they're paying really big bills to train these people, right? They say, hey, come in with no experience. I'll make you a tool and die maker. I'll make you a press, I'll make you a process tech or whatever it is. They're not able to even find the people willing to go in to take that level of education. Um, and what really what we see happening when we look at the data is that a lot of our manufacturing clients stopped hiring during the Great Recession because, frankly, you guys know better than I do. Their businesses were quite challenged. Um, so they stopped hiring at that point in time when a lot of millennials were graduating out of college. And frankly, that gap is really rearing its head today. Um, not only do we have an average age of an owner, right? The average age of an owner is over 60. Um, we have an average age in workforce overall. We don't have succession plans not for key leaders or for other areas of the business, right? So if I have a production manager who's in his late 60s and says, hey, you know, I want to retire in the next four years, there's no one there that's even considering being the next person to be that production manager. You lose a production manager, your facility doesn't run. Um, so beyond that, right, what we're really watching in our bottom line is that it's costing these guys a lot of money. And what they're starting to tell us and what the data is starting to show us is they're choosing not to grow their businesses which is a big challenge, right? So they're saying, hey, I'm not going to take on more revenue because I don't have the people to do the work. Or in some cases, they're even saying, I'm going to shrink my business, which brings me to my second point, their other biggest challenge, which is they can't make money at the rate that they used to be able to. You said there's a lot of compounding issues and everything. There's a lot of compounding issues in this one as well. Um, but some of the core pieces of it that we're seeing is that Despite these businesses increasing their efficiency levels, so they're absolutely doing better from an efficiency and throughput perspective, they're not making more money. So when we look at their actual profit margins, they're not going up. They're frankly going down quite substantially. Um, it's due to a lot of different reasons. One of them is the labor piece, which we talked about, so I won't go into too much more detail there. The other piece is this overall cost of doing business. Um, so it's everything from energy prices, it's transportation costs. The rail strike was a really big, or potential rail strike, excuse me, was a very big challenge to these individuals. Healthcare costs, um, and everything from temp agency upcharges, right? So when somebody's trying to get temp labor in the door, it's 30 to 40% higher than it used to be. Um, interest rates on loans is a big one. Most of these companies do not have cash. They're privately held, but they all use lines of credit. So that's really impacting them as well. The other piece that's preventing them from being able to make money at least consistently is they had a lot of PPP or ERC funding, just depending on the type of business. Most of them did get that because they are privately held and small. Some of them used it better than others, right? Some of them used it as a lifeline and frankly just delayed some of the challenges that they were feeling before COVID even took its toll. And now that that money's dried up, they're feeling those same challenges again. My final piece on kind of their challenges from a financial perspective, which is potentially the most challenging to quantify, but I did my best to put it into numbers, um, is this increased chaos that they felt over the last 24 months is really preventing them from being able to make money. So the best way I can kind of articulate that to you is that most of the customers and companies that I work with don't know their customer demand. They don't know the schedule on their shop floor. They frankly don't even know who's going to show up to work in a given week and in some cases in a given day. I mean, there were periods of time in 2020 where we would talk with customers who would say, I got, I got into work today and eight things changed between 7 and 8 a.m., right? So they, they don't know how to do this. At the end of the day, what that's doing is that's driving up massive amounts of transactional waste. It costs a lot of money to hire someone, even if they never show up. It still costs money to get them and process them and give them health care and all that. Additionally, it's tying up a lot of money in inventory. So we've seen massive shifts in inventory right now. Um, and the final thing is that it's really costing them way more cash than it ever did before. So their ability to have any flexibility in terms of how they spend their money and how they make money is gone. Um, and at the end of the day, right, this is a massive group of people. They're not all the same, but the viability of many of these businesses long term is really concerning to us. 
those are very difficult challenges that you're dealing with. Um, could you give us a, some perspective on how supply chain issues are continuing to impact your business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will flip to the final page of the notes. Um, so from more of a supply chain perspective, um, we are based in Southfield in Detroit, Michigan. So we do work a lot in the automotive space, but we also work in others. I personally came out of the appliance arena, so we work across most of them. Um, a lot of the challenges today seem to be around semiconductors. That's a big thing um, that seems to get picked up a lot in the press. It is absolutely an issue. I'm not going to belittle it. Um, but there are a lot more problems than just semiconductors. To speak on the semiconductor one just for a second, some of the core challenges that we're seeing is not only does automotive need semiconductors, but your refrigerator needs semiconductors. There was like a new PlayStation that came out last year, and that needs semiconductors. I, a lot of people talked about it. I don't PlayStation and Xbox are confusing to me, but either way. So that was demanding microchips, all of these different things. So automotive companies can get them, which means that this whole demand problem that our customers are facing, they have no way to plan when they're going to get chips in order to put them into the parts that they're ultimately supplying. The other piece on the semiconductors, just real quick, is that when you think about an electric vehicle coming into play, they require at least 30% more, sometimes even more than that, than an internal combustion engine does. So if we adopt more electric vehicles, we're demanding more semiconductors than we ever have before. But beyond the semiconductor challenges, probably some of the more concerning things to me and maybe less easier to solve challenges from a supply chain perspective are centered around things like transportation and freight, which all of you talked about in different arenas. Um, but a lot of that applies to things much more than automotive as well, right? So you talked about the agriculture business. We work with companies who can't get washers and bolts to make trailers to hitch, hitch on the back of their F-150s to get whatever they need to get, wherever they need to get it, right? Um, the other big supply chain challenge that we don't really see a light at the end of the tunnel for is natural disasters. You talked about it from an agriculture perspective. There's a lot of impact to that on the resin and steel markets as well. Um, I, the resin market specifically, there are certain types of resin that ultimately allow you to make your dashboard or make the some of the plastic that we probably have in this room right now, um, the capability for them to get that resin even before the most recent round of natural disasters occurred, some of the major freezes that happened last year, it was already in force majeure. So these companies were already taking the time to go, we need this because it's a crisis, and then it got worse, right? And that had nothing to do with any of the port challenges or any of the difficulty getting a bolt out of China or somewhere else. Um, so that was one of the big pieces on the on the supply chain front, um, I, I guess my to bottom line it for you guys, at least if I could, in terms of what we're seeing from the supply chain piece of it, automotive specifically, historically, has been a 17 million a year sales volume in the U.S. This year, we're forecasted to do about 14 million units. If you look at the OEMs, which are publicly traded companies, unlike my customers, they're making money and they're doing quite well. They have their challenges, as do all businesses. They don't necessarily have a reason to go back up to 17 million units based off what we see today. The reason why I bring that up is because this means that we have a lot of people who are supplying to them who are dealing with a much higher mix because everyone wants something different in their car today or different in their appliance, and we're dealing with a much lower volume. So at the end of the day, what that does is that increases the complexity for everybody that we work with. And then within that, what that does is that makes them really challenged to manage all of the supply chain pieces that we talked about. And at the end of the day, they're focused on this week, am I going to run out of cash or am I going to shut down my supplier's line, right? So, I mean, these are the kinds of decisions that these companies are facing. So I don't know if that fully answers it, but that's where we're at. Fantastic. I'd like to open it for anyone. Yeah, so I'm just curious if, if these firms, it sounds like some of them have more demand than they can handle. So if there's a downturn in the economy, how are they going to manage? Yeah, so I, they absolutely have more demand that they can handle. From an inventory perspective, we're still well below it. Um, we saw demand on average for them go up nearly 30% between 2020 and 2021. It's plateaued a little bit, but it's still relatively high. In terms of that demand lowering, I frankly think some of them would be, I'm not going to say pleased, but would be relieved by that. Because the intention of that demand lowering would mean, hey, maybe a couple of my 20, 30, 40 open positions I no longer need to hire for. Um, maybe I can take a breath to actually manage my business and focus on continuous improvement. Obviously, we don't want demand to shrink too terribly much. Right. Um, but what I will tell you, and at least in automotive specifically, is there's pretty hefty demand planned um, from a 
from a tooling and new product perspective. So we have a lot of new vehicles coming out in the market in the next couple of years. It's really positive. So we absolutely have the demand to do so. The challenge is if they're able to run their businesses to still, to still make money, even when the demand is still there. Does that help answer? Yeah. I have two questions about the, the long run. I, in my previous life, life, I was a professor at Michigan State, so had students from Michigan. And in my senior seminar on the current state of the economy, and I taught it for about uh, 15 years or so, the last time I taught it was 2019. And the question that I posed at the beginning of the semester is, do you think you're better off than your parents were at this age? And for the first time in 2019, students said post Great Recession, they said that they thought that they were better off because they had interesting jobs that their parents had to work on the line and that they thought these were boring jobs. So, you know, people don't want to show up for uh, tool and die jobs. My students' reaction would be, that's boring. That's not the Apple store. So, like, that seems long term. That seems structural. So, so how do you how do you address that? I mean, this, yeah. How do you how do, how do you, how do your businesses say that they would address something like that? Yeah. How do you make ma manufacturing sexy? Yeah, that's that's the end all question that we face almost every day with our businesses. It's very challenging to make manufacturing sexy. I'll tell you that. I would tell you that if you go into the average manufacturing facility, there are floors that I would eat off of. I mean, there are impeccable mm -hmm. facilities in this country. They're beautifully maintained. Everything from, I mean, yes, OEMs and tier ones, very large companies are doing a great job, but I walk into $10 million plants that are beautiful, have state-of-the-art equipment. You've got 20-somethings working on million-dollar machines and coding that never got a four-year degree, but went to an apprenticeship program and are doing really cool stuff. The biggest challenge we have is encouraging more people to do that. The only way that we found success so far, at least our clients have, is they've focused on actually talking to the parents at very young ages. So starting in like elementary and middle school about the benefits and the career development opportunities in manufacturing that don't require a four-year degree. I have a four-year degree. I know many people here have a lot more than one four-year degree. So I understand the benefits of higher education, but it doesn't mean that everyone needs it. So we're focused very strong on trying to encourage people to go into manufacturing because it's, I'm a nerd for it, but it's really cool. <laughs> so I have just a quick question, um, and this is a longer term question too. So to what extent, because of these labor demand challenges, to what extent have businesses adopted automation to fill the labor demand? Yeah, they so they absolutely focus on automation um, pretty clearly all the time. I was at, um, you spoke about big conferences. I was at the Inter International Ma Manufacturing Technology Show in Chicago a couple weeks ago, actually very well attended. So that was positive. I stayed at a Marriott. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, we were at that show um, and the core focus was on automation. So it's everything from automation within a machining cell. So if you're cutting a piece of steel, they're really focused on how do I have multiple pallets to make sure that I can do things um, without people, right? How can I run this machine for 24 hours and then have some guy sitting at home on his cell phone being able to monitor it? Because, I mean, they have that technology today. Every machine monitoring company will give you an app on your phone. Um, so they're focused quite a bit on that piece of it. There's also a lot of automation in terms of lifting and material handling, um, and even in terms of some of the warehousing pieces of it as well. So how do I get a machine to wrap a box? And how do I get, frankly, any automation to do what even in manufacturing we may call the less intriguing jobs um, so that we can have people actually making parts and actually designing and actually checking quality and doing the things that are, what I'll say, more fun than packaging a box of parts, right? We have, at this point, automation that can do that. I just had a quick question. Um, I think it's, I think Chris and I are kind of going in the same direction on these questions. Uh, and I'll ask it to you, but anybody else can jump in. So in a normal economy, if demand softens a lot, you know, first thing businesses do, you know, they often will lay off workers. This is, seems like an unusual economy where businesses have been scrambling to get workers for so long. If demand softens, do you think they would respond differently this time in terms of uh, those workforces, or do you think they just would, would do the kind of usual 
playbook in terms of trying to shrink costs. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it probably depends on the business a bit. Um, obviously everyone's different and I don't know all of them, but I do think they would approach it differently. Um, I think one of the things that at least in our space they may consider doing is looking more closely at who is it that may actually be close to retirement age anyway, that we could help them. And now they maybe feel comfort to be able to leave the workforce. And then how do we get that tribal knowledge out of that individual before they leave, right? Um, the big thing with our workforce is going to be that the, the people who may necessarily want to leave the workforce at some point in time, they have all of the knowledge on how to do everything, every average good that we see in this country, right? There's some guy sitting in an office that's a tool maker that knows exactly how to manufacture that part. Um, I don't think they would do massive rounds of layoffs, but I do think they would potentially strategically say, hey, let's, I mean, frankly, let's rank our A, B, and C players, right? Who adds the most value in our business and who are we hiring because we were really desperate for people in this massive demand surge? And they may choose to let go of some of those individuals, but that would always for them be non-skilled labor. I can't see any circumstance where they would get rid of skilled labor um, and would probably not be a critical mass of their workforce for the most part, at least in the privately held businesses I work with. I, I can't speak as much for the publicly traded guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our pan first panel and your, our panelists, Tom, Chidi, Jess, Kara, all the information that you've provided and shared with us today really just helps us better understand the data that we look at um, here at the Federal Reserve. So now we'll take a quick break. Um, we'll come back in about 10 minutes and uh, Vice Chair Brainerd will chair our, our second panel. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Really, Thank you. really Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right, guys. So uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think about this. Um, let me know what you guys think about this so far, guys. I mean, the market's starting to rebound. We're back up, you know, a decent amount over the last 10 minutes. Uh, and so, yeah, everybody right now, I see all this 12, 1300 people. They're going to be back in about 10 minutes. Everybody right now, do me a favor, okay? Our crypto channel is so close to hitting a 1,000 subscribers. We are so close here, guys. We need like 55 or something like that. Yeah, we need 54 subscribers, guys. I see you guys here now. We got 1,200 of you guys. All of y'all aren't subscribed to my crypto channel as a favor, we put out free stock market information, free crypto information. We don't sell a course. We don't sell a service. We don't claim to be experts. We put all this stuff out for free. We cover all the big stuff going on. Check out the link. Go sub to the crypto channel. Do it now. Help us break a 1,000 subscribers right now. I'll never pressure you to subscribe, but if you don't do it, we'll hate you forever, okay? Subscribe right now, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, market's starting to bounce back. Do you think the market rebounds today? Do you think the SPY hits 370 today? I think it's a good question. Does the SPY hit 370 today? Let me know. Uh, do you think the market's going to rebound? What do you think the market's going to do next week, guys, is a real question here. What do you think the market's going to do next week? Okay, we're down so much over the past couple of days after the 75 basis point rate hike on Wednesday. The market's down a ton. Um, we have been kind of slowly adding to Disney. Disney's at 99 now. Our entry now is about 101.80s or so. SPY starting to rebound here. You can see the bounce back. We can look at like the Q, which is a little bit more tech heavy as a broad market ETF. Uh, it's at 274s. Let's see if these get back over VWAP here. Here's the SPY. We got the S&P 500 here at about 36.70. So uh, again, let me know what you guys think is going to happen. Do you guys think the market continues to rebound? Do you think it rejects and comes back down to lows? How do you think the market is going to act and respond during next week? And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think here, team. Should be a fun uh, time in the market. Uh, again, just to put this into perspective, Let me ask you this. You think people are going to trade the upside today going into the weekend? I don't know. I think it ba it's based off of extension. Uh, I think at this point in time, the, this is the way I'm looking at it right now. Even if the market does crash more from here on out, Disney makes so much money. Disney owns Marvel, Star Wars, ESPN. You know, they own all these big media brands. They're really diversified. Their Disney World parks earn about $20 million a day. Okay. Disney at $99, in my subjective opinion, and I might be wildly wrong and maybe Disney crashes, but Disney at $99, I just think there's value there. I think if you look at this over the next five to 10 years, Disney is almost certainly going to be over where what level it is now. And so I think what we have now is some discounts. Maybe the market keeps crashing. And of course, you have no idea what it's going to do. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I hope the market does well. I uh, know. So it, it, it comes back in 10 minutes, guys. 10 minutes. Um, the conference resumes in about seven minutes from now. Press conference resumes in about uh, 10 minutes from now, seven minutes or so after this. Uh, but again, let me know what you guys think.
Disney at 92 is a better deal. It really is, Leon. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, yeah, guys, right now we're on hold. Uh, they're doing a 10-minute bathroom break, and they're going to be back live in about uh, probably about seven to eight minutes or so. I'm looking at the crypto channel here, guys. Hey, we, we only need about 40 subscribers left. 40 subscribers left. Hey, do me a favor. I'll put the link in chat. I'll also put it in the description. Sub to be getter crypto. Free crypto information. My big thing is uh, we don't sell a service. We don't uh, we don't sell our own service, at least. We have sponsors and affiliates and stuff like that. Uh, but we don't charge for any of our content. We, there's no paywalls behind anything. I don't even claim to be a good trader. We just kind of put out free info. And uh, if you guys appreciate that, again, subscribe here. We certainly appreciate it. We broke 86,000 subscribers. So uh, thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. Uh, we are growing like crazy. Here's my profit graph today. So we, we trade at the open every weekday as well. Uh, this is my profit graph today. And again, my job in this funded account program from Top Step is to build up a cushion first. So you can see like starting the day I trade micros and macro future contracts. Starting the day I start trading the micros, which is smaller sizing and futures. And you could do this with stocks. You can do it with crypto. You can do it with futures. But starting the day, I trade small. So I trade the micros. And you can see I slowly build up a cushion to $100. Here's this $100 level right here, right? So you can see this $100 level right here. Uh, once I build up that cushion to 100 bucks, and I have that $100 cushion that I can swing a little bit heavier into, that's when I start trading the macro, you know, the regular E-mini, the regular NASDAQ 100, the regular market, the regular SPY. Uh, and that's when I start to scale up my size because at that point, even if I lose, right, if I lose 100 bucks, I'm right back to square one. I'm right back to break even. And, you know, I'm not down on the day. But if I win, then I can win a lot more. And so that makes it to where I have losing days. They're small, but my winning days are large. Uh, and so, again, you can see how steep the angle goes in my profit graph here after I break $100 in profit because we scaled up to the macro E-mini, the regular NASDAQ 100. And you can see we slowly rolled it up about 3x and we're up about 280 on the day. Uh, so that's what we do. I think a lot of people can learn from that type of risk management system. I think a lot of people just trade too large in markets. Uh, and so we try to trade small and slow and steady. Um, and yeah, let me know what you guys think. Dow will recover towards 30,000. I'm not sure. No idea. Uh, again, as you guys know, I'm not an investment professional, not liable. If you guys lose, no idea what the markets are going to do. We're all just guessing and speculating here. I hope they come back. I tend to be an optimist. Uh, I hope the market turns back. But again, you never really know. Um, again, they should resume in about... Hey, thank you, Wizard. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, they should resume. Um, I think they took a break. Let me see when the scheduled break is supposed to be. Uh, give me one second here. Let me find. I have the... I do have the uh, schedule here. And so, yeah, 310 is the break. Uh, they should resume right about now. You know, right about now. Uh, they might have gone a little bit over. Uh, let me make sure we're live. But, yeah, they should be resuming right about now. Um, so they're scheduled to resume at 325, which is exactly right now. So they should come back anytime. First, we're going to get uh, Leo Brannard, uh, vice chair, uh, as the moderator, Leo Brannard. Um, they're going to have Derek Shubbs. Uh, Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, Brenda Heiler from San Jacinto College out here in Houston. A hey, shout out to them. Uh, Nancy Lehman from AARP in Washington and Wendy Valiz from Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation. Um, so, yeah, that's what's coming up, guys. Market has started to rebound here. Uh, again, stick around. Hey, thank you, Z. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man. Uh, are you shorting the market? No, I'm mostly going. I, I, yeah, I'm shorting in, in terms of this profit graph. Yes. So these are almost all, I think these are, every one of these trades was a short position, you know, a, a short term day trade, but it was a short, I was betting the market would drop. I shorted the opening bell. If you look at like the spy here, for instance, um, what I did was to, to build this graph up here was I just attacked this downward trend. If we remove this, um, what I essentially did was I used the volume weighted average price right here. And I waited for bounces to the volume weighted average price. And I would short into these pops. I would wait for big drops like this big weakness moves and then i would short into the follow through pop you know and i'm using a funded account program in futures and so essentially what they're doing it's called top step uh they are a sponsor of my video here so i am biased in their favor of course uh, but top step essentially gives gives you a demo account and if you can hit their target while following their rules then they'll fund you between 50 up to 150k with a 90 percent split they're regulated by the chicago mercantile exchange they pay out millions every year they fund thousands of traders a year uh, again they are a sponsor i'm in the 150k combine i also trade my regular account though i trade a thirty thousand dollar 120k buying power account uh on thinkorswim td ameritrade so i have a i have a big account as well a, a larger account it's all relative i guess but i have about 120k in buying power so i'll just buy the spy directly uh, a lot of the times um 
but yeah, if you want to check out Top Step, uh, again, they are a funded account program. There's no PDT rule in futures, and you can essentially trade the SPY through the E-mini. The E-mini mimics the SPY and the S&P. Uh, the NASDAQ 100 uh, does as well to a certain extent. And so you can essentially get around the PDT rule in futures. Uh, you can check out that link if you want to you know, learn more about what I'm doing in that regard. Uh, but I, as I said, you know, uh, I also just trade my regular TOS account, which has uh, 30,000 in it. It's got about 120K in buying power. And then usually anything I'm up over that, I just withdraw it kind of rinse and repeat 120k in buying power my regular account is usually plenty and that's not a demo account that's a real account you can see me trade that every day at the uh, in, at our morning live streams and uh, yeah they should be back pretty soon we're waiting for them to start again uh, they were scheduled to start uh, at 25 but i think they're running about 5 minutes over uh yeah you can uh yeah so i could use the demo option here uh, but you can see like here's the demo right here the practice account i didn't trade on the practice account at all and then here's my actual combine account and so that's my graph today this is my graph total over the month and i can't fake this this is pulled directly from my platform um so that's my profit graph so far so we're doing okay uh, again not an investment professional i can't guarantee i'm gonna keep doing well i hope i do y'all hit the subscribe button um yeah I like your trading strategy. Hey, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Um, but yeah, uh, again, if you want to check out Top Step, it's pinned at the top of the page as well. If you're interested, uh, you can find the link pinned at the top of the chat right above the poll that we have going on. And we're just waiting for them to start now. Um, again, we we give out free stock market information here. We don't claim to be experts. That's why it's called beginner trading is because we're just a resource and community for traders as a whole. Um, yeah, and y'all subscribe. We appreciate it. We did break uh, 86,000. We're pushing towards... Uh, 87 now, pushing towards 100K, getting that check mark, which we will get it soon. We will get it soon, hopefully this year. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the love and support, guys. Uh, it's been a fun meeting so far. Uh, hey, thank you, Marco. View for next week, please. I, I don't know. I'm I really have no idea what the market's going to do next week. No idea. I'm cautiously optimistic. I hope the market does well next week, but of course, you never really know. And you know, uh, we've dropped a lot. We could continue dropping. Inflation is still high. The Fed aggressively raised rates to 75 basis points, which was what was expected here uh, this Wednesday. Um, and so next week, you know, we do have some earnings coming out, specifically Nike, Micron. Those are going to influence markets. Uh, we have Bed Bath and Beyond earnings, so that might influence those stocks as well. Uh, so we do have some influential earnings happening next week. We're going to cover those and stream those earnings reports and calls live, like we always do. And so y'all be ready for that. But yeah, we got Nike, Carmax, uh, BB. Uh, Micron, which is MU. We have those earnings. We're going to cover those four earnings reports. And again, guys, we cover all the major ones. We cover all the big earnings reports. We stream the actual earnings call as well as cover the actual earnings that drop as soon as they drop, as well as the stock market's reaction to them. We cover all the big news. We cover CPI, PPI, jobless claims, unemployment, Fed meetings, Jerome Powell conferences. Uh, and we also just kind of you know day trade, swing trade, and invest every day at the opening bell with a 30,000, 120K BP account. Um, on Think or Swim. We've, doing, we've been doing it for years. And uh, hey, let's keep this growth up, guys. We appreciate you all being here. And uh, they should be starting pretty soon. Uh, yeah, just to give you some perspective here, Powell did the opening remarks, uh, but he's kind of like the host here. At least he was for that first part. Um, so he, he did the opening remarks. And then there's a lot of speakers that range from politicians to business people. Uh, and in that regard, you know, Jay Powell is essentially acting as the host, asking some questions. Uh, here we go. They're back live. The side of um, communities and um, how uh, they are experiencing um, uh, the economy. And we've got uh, representatives from four different uh, community organizations. Um, and uh, so we'll have a chance to ask related questions um, to hear about um, the, the, the people that you work with. Um, you know, just uh, stepping back for a second, if I think a little bit about the cross currents um, that are uh, hitting the economy. We, you know, on the one hand, we've got Americans back to school, back to work, even if they're not in work places, they're back to work. Um, and uh, the economy really did come out of the pandemic with some strength. Um, recently saw a report um, suggesting unprecedented declines um, in child's, uh, children's poverty, um, even with the pandemic uh, over the last few decades. And of course, that's uh, looking to the future. Um, when I look more towards um, our retired populations, um, we've seen uh, two and a quarter million people retire early. Um, associated with the pandemic, and they don't seem to be coming back to the workforce. Um, we have seen um, high
high wage growth among the lowest income workers. Um, but looking overall, wages haven't kept up with inflation and inflation is very high. And if we look at um, who uh, bears the burden, everybody is affected by um, high inflation. But of course, uh, it puts special uh, burdens on lower income families, as well as on people uh, with fixed incomes. And if we look at lower income families, they spend three quarters of their incomes on necessities. Um, more than twice uh, what higher income people do. And of course, that's really concentrated in food. Uh, prices at the pump associated with the war um, against Ukraine, not obvious uh, that we're going to see a lot of relief there. And we heard a little bit about drought as well. So what I'd like to do is just drill into how the people that you're serving are experiencing some of those cross currents. So I'm going to start with Derek Chubbs. Uh, Derek is president and CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank in Orlando, Florida, which is the region's largest hunger relief agency. Uh, it, it distributes more than 250,000 meals per day. Is that right? In central, in six central Florida counties. Um, Derek uh, previously led the Central Texas Food Bank in Austin, um, and he's held senior leadership positions at the American Red Cross and companies such as IBM, Pervasive, <clears throat> Software, and Dell. So Derek, welcome. We're really glad that you could be here with us. Um, I do want to just hone in on this uh, issue of food security and just ask you how high inflation, particularly in food, uh, is affecting the communities you serve and your organization's ability to serve them. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to sit amongst you and advocate for those individuals who are unable to advocate for themselves. Uh, this is extremely important. It doesn't happen often, so I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity and your willingness to listen. We, you know, we've all had a couple of difficult years, and so have those we served. And we were all ready to believe that uh, post-pandemic life was going to be back to normal. Uh, but as it turns out, for those who experience hunger or are concerned about hunger, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, Second Harvest Food Bank of Central Florida is one of a couple hundred food banks that make up the Feeding America network across the country. Uh, also one of 14 food banks that span across the state of Florida. And while my story or our story in many cases is going to be central to Central Florida, Around 65 to 70 percent of my peer CEOs and executive directors across the country would sit here and tell a very similar story. You know, during the pandemic, we had a strong national response. Uh, we had strong government response. We had strong charity responses. And we couldn't be more excited about that. But that enhanced support uh, with uh, unemployment assistance, stimulus checks, child care you know, assistance, homeowner assistance was wonderful, but now that we've combined it with inflation, that means that the problems are cropping up all over again. Uh, what's different this time is that the level of support that we received during the pandemic is on the decline. Feeding America itself estimates that there are probably during the pandemic around 53 million Americans across the country who aren't really, who aren't really sure where their next meal is coming from. Let's wrap our heads around that number. It's a lot of people, it's a lot of children. One in five of our babies don't know where their next meal is com coming from. In Central Florida, we estimate around a half million are food uh, insecure and aren't really sure where uh, their next meal is coming from. And most of those individuals are suffering from a recovery period. Uh, I once heard a stat that was around the fact that most of Americans only had around 400 bucks set aside for a rainy day. So think of that rainy day fund pre-pandemic. Think of that rainy day period through unemployment and the challenges that we saw during the pandemic. Think of how long it'll take to recover when you've lost a job or someone in the family has lost a job. And that basically brings us to today. In Central Florida, before the pandemic, we were distributing around 150,000 meals a day. Uh, during the pandemic, that number went up to 300,000 meals a day. And today we're leveling off at around 250,000 meals a day. 
And let me add a little additional context to that. In 2019, around January, a gallon of milk was around $2.90. Uh, today, it's over $4. Now, if I'm someone who was struggling with food insecurity at the $2.90 mark, the likelihood of my being able to recover from that today is somewhat slim. And I don't know about you, but very rarely do we go back to the grocery store and see those prices return back to where they were two years ago. So we hear so many stories from our clients. Uh, we distribute our food through a group of about 500 partner agencies. These are soup kitchens, food pantries, and the like. Some of them specialize in focusing on seniors. Some of them focalize, focus on uh, providing uh, food for those who are experiencing homelessness. And we're hearing a variety of different kinds of stories. They range from, I'm having to sell my food stamps in order to get my rent paid. That's today. Uh, from, you know, the script is flipped. You know, first there was a shutdown and lack of income and funds. Now, two, year la two years later, we're paying back everything and it's hurting more than ever before. 40 or $50,000 used to really matter. And now making 40 to $50,000, I can barely get my rent paid in Central Florida. You know, that's what we're looking at today. And I'm gonna probably answer both of your questions <laughs> that I have with this, if you don't mind. Something that we like to say frequently, and I might've been face this myself when it first started is the face of hunger really isn't what we think. We automatically default to this preconceived notion that you're either homeless, you're unemployed, or you just don't want to work. Uh, when a significant portion of those that depend on our services day in and day out are working families, some of them working multiple jobs. Uh, and they range from seniors, they range from who, we're on a fixed income, or now that the pandemic has passed and we're seeing heightened inflation that they may be taking care of one of their own children or taking care of their grandchildren. So it's that same fixed income, but the cost is even more. Um, <clears throat> you know, in addition to that, just the normal family that's we're seeing families bring in other families and families combining themselves just so they can make ends meet. And particularly when we're talking about the rising cost of housing that we continue to see. So that's what our clients are seeing or those who depend on us are seeing on day in and day out. But those challenges, our food banks are not immune to those challenges either. You know, we're still businesses running day in and day out trying to provide these services. And we are seeing challenges from a food sourcing perspective. Tom and I were talking outside when we mentioned uh, the drought that's taking place. We source a significant amount of food from farmers. And if that food isn't there, then we're going to have problems sourcing it. Uh, we typically would, we get food, or most food banks get food in three ways, primarily. Uh, there's the food that is donated to us throughout the retail, from the retail channels. Uh, there's food that's provided to us from the government, from the USDA. And then there's the food that we purchase. Uh, on the average second harvest of Central Florida, we would spend around two and a half million on an annualized basis pre-pandemic. This past July, we had already spent six million. So we, that's then 25% increase in transportation costs. We put 22 trucks on the road every single morning. Uh, that's the cost of food that we're having to see and trying to procure that food. And that's also with the increased demand that we're seeing for that food as well. So those are some of the issues that we're you know, starting to see day in and day out. It's short, but it's very to the point. We don't see anything ending anytime soon. In fact, we're about to go into the holiday season and every single one of us in, every single one of us in the room probably associates food and family with the holiday season but there'll be millions of americans who won't be able to do that millions of children who will not be able to do that based on the economic situation that we're seeing today because so many of them simply have not recovered and that's what we're seeing and again thank you again for the opportunity to just bring this 
issue to the surface on behalf of myself as well as my other 199 peers across the country. Let me ask my colleagues if they have questions. If not, I do have one follow up. So I'm still struggling a little bit. We've got this hot jobs market <clears throat> and wages have grown a lot and food security is really fragile and it sounds like no relief in sight. So how do I reconcile those things? I'm not entirely sure how you reconcile those things, Governor. Um, we're asking ourselves the same question. When the, need, when the need increases, we've been able to scale so far. Uh, again, the challenge is simply around those that we provide services to are struggling to recover. Uh, we're also seeing the demographics change a bit as well. We used to automatically associate hunger with low income. Uh, we're starting to see middle class, part of that as well, low income. Uh, we're starting to see middle class, part of that as well, simply challenges that they're seeing. 40% of our new, we've seen a 40% increase in people who are seeking out our services for the first time. I wish you could hear some of those stories. I never, ever thought I would be here. Uh, we were doing fine a couple of years ago. And now we are literally struggling to make ends meet. Whatever little money we have runs out around the third week of the month. And thank goodness we have food banks that we can depend on. But there's only so much that even we can do because the gap really didn't narrow from what we are distributing on a daily basis. We don't, we don't, we're not seeing that gap today, Governor. In fact, we're seeing that number increase. Can I ask a few more? This is just kind of a data question. So of all the, the people you service, what fraction would be, say, elderly, retired, working, poor, non-working? We are not capturing a significant, and I have to give you, I can give you dated information on that. We don't have that information as of today. Oh. All right. But what we would typically see is, let's go back to that, those experiencing homelessness. That's a less than, that was a less than 10% number. Uh, what we saw with those that were working, uh, that was in the high 60 percentile range, pushing 70%, working at least one job, and in so many cases, even more than that. So those are the numbers that we're starting to, we're starting to see. We'll get new data probably toward the end of this year, but uh, based on the fact that we're still 40 to 60% higher than we were pre-pandemic, the likelihood of those numbers changing very radically is pretty slim. Yeah, so I guess this goes back to Governor Brainerd's question. You have people who are working. They're mm -hmm. in a hot labor market, but they're not earning enough to even have food security. Absolutely. That is the challenge that we're seeing. Can I just ask, if you've spent, or if you're using up $6 million by July, how do you expect to be able to continue to provide the same level of service throughout the rest of this year and then into next year? What, how are you thinking about how you'll be able to continue providing this vital service to, to these people in need? That's a, that's a good question, Governor, and thank you. Uh, we were very fortunate during the pandemic, the community rolled out in ways that were unimaginable. Uh, but we, but now is the time that we're spending down on, on those dollars. Uh, we expect at the current rate uh, we expect that to last maybe about another couple of years max. Uh, however, we don't see the need decreasing. You know, we don't see the need dec decreasing next year, nor do we see the need decreasing into 2024. We're hoping toward the end of 2024, we may see we may start to see things level off a bit. Your funding comes mostly <laughs> from government, mostly from private donations, from long-term foundations or where does it where does it tend to come from from a central florida perspective the majority of our donations come from individuals, individuals. which is very comforting uh, around you know over 60 percent comes from comes from individuals so uh, we're hoping that that will continue even though it's starting to decline not a steep decline but i think a significant portion of that is the thought process that or the misconception <clears throat> that this thing is over and it's not. Thanks. All right. Um, well, thanks, uh, Derek. Thank We're going to move uh, next uh, to Dr. Brenda Hellyer. Brenda is the fifth chancellor of San Jacinto College. 
which is the eighth largest community college in Texas and a national top five community college as recognized by the Aspen Institute. Uh, before becoming uh, chancellor in 2009, Brenda served in a variety of roles, including executive vice chancellor, vice chancellor for fiscal affairs, and executive vice president for resource development, and previously was in the corporate world and a small business owner. So Brenda, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you know, it'd be great to hear a little bit about what jobs you are preparing your students from, for, whether um, those jobs and skills have shifted um, in this post-pandemic uh, economy, um, and as a result, whether you've made changes um, to your educational offerings to help prepare your students for the, for the job market that we're seeing today. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. I'm absolutely delighted. So San Jacinto College is in the Gulf Coast um, region. Um, we're outside of Houston. We have um, this fall about 31,000 students. Um, we are down about 2,000 students or 6% since um, fall of 19, which is our prior pre-COVID numbers. We, um, we serve about 65% uh, of our students are Hispanic about 10% are black and our um, white population is declining about 17% um, right now. 42% of our students are first generation to college. And if um, I look by demographics, um, about 48% of our Hispanic students are first generation to college. Our high schools or our school districts in the area, they are about 75% on free and reduced lunch. And, and so pretty high um, economic um, needs there. From a standpoint of um, breakdown males to females, um, we lost a lot of males during the COVID um, from that enrollment standpoint. Our males had been at 41% through COVID, then they were down to 38% of our enrollment. Um, it was almost all the decline were in our, our male students. We are, are back on, on a percentage right now. Uh, where we are seeing a decline still is with our black um, males coming back to school and really reaching out into them. When I, um, our enrollment, when I look at the pieces of it, our first time in college students are kind of flat right now. We had lost quite a few from those May 2020 graduates. They didn't go anywhere. When we can see that um, the college going rate in our community was 52% before COVID, um, that um, those May 2020 graduates, it was only 45%. So I'm, I'm really concerned, where are they? How do we bring them back? Um, we've seen increases in first time in college students since then, but we've also seen a decline in our over 25 year old students. And so um, that's an area that we're really reaching into to understand what's going on. So of our offerings, about 35% um, are directly tied to workforce training. And so getting into the jobs, um, we're in the heart of petrochemical, um, we're in the heart of maritime, aerospace, and then the health sciences. And so those are the major jobs we're, we're training for. And um, we're very lucky for the relationships we have in our community. And when I say that um, in Petrochem, there's 133 petrochemical companies in our region. And so um, these are great paying jobs. Um, one of our graduates will come out and make 65,000 the first year, and that's with an associate degree. The other thing that was really important is before COVID, before the pandemic, we had very strong relationships with industry. Um, all community colleges have advisory committees made up of industry people who serve on them working on curriculum. We also at my college have an advisory council. It's a chancellor's advisory council and it's C-suite. I mean, it's um, our plant managers, our, our VPs, and our CEOs meeting with, with me and members of my team. And we're really focused strategically on workforce needs. So with petrochemical, Right before COVID, we had opened a $60 million new training facility. Um, and it was a facility, if you talk to industry, they'll say this is an in a facility designed by industry for industry. It is a day in the life of an operator. It takes students all the way through um, what really is going to happen out of the plant. Even to a point, their um, last semester with us, they're doing shift work. They're doing um, 
24 hour shift work, eight hour shifts so that they can climb the, the stack. Um, it's a two story, 8,000 square foot training facility, but they're doing it just like they would at a plant. And um, it was a total redesign of curriculum. Industry wanted to rebrand in our community because you had asked the question, um, Governor Cook, about people living in these areas, that these jobs weren't sexy to them. It's what hap was happening with our youth. We didn't have a pipeline. And, and so um, we really worked with industry to redesign how we trained and how we recruited together, going into high schools, going into eighth grade and trying to build. These are the jobs. And they're not the jobs that you had, before, your parents had where it didn't take a, a credential. So that was, that's been important work. We've done the same thing with Maritime. Um, we're the number one port in the country. And um, I heard all the logistics problems. That's exactly what we were trying to train for. Um, deck hands, um, towboat operators, tug operators. And, and so again, a, uh, a program designed by industry, US Coast Guard approved courses. We're right there on the ship channel. People didn't even know about these jobs. So the demand is definitely there. Um, how it's changed is um, through COVID, our partners were nervous that we weren't doing the technical hands-on training because there was so much remote. Um, and, and so we made it really clear how we were doing hybrid. Um, a lot of the lecture piece can be on, um, online. But the hands-on, you got to come into class and you get that hands-on. You can't learn to run a control room remotely. Uh, you can't learn to, to run a tug if you're not on the simulator there where you're, you're, you're getting that. Another area where we really saw changes is in the health sciences, nursing. And so um, we have always prepared licensed vocational nurses, associate degree nurses, and we had just gotten approved from the state of Texas to do a bachelor of science in nursing because so many of our hospitals were going to BSN. Um, through COVID, that's all changed. Um, what we're doing right now is we're working on a pipeline from CNAs, um, certified nursing assistants, to LVNs, to associate degree, to bachelor, so that our hospitals have that team approach. And it has really been, um, when I called them, they were like, no, Brenda, don't stop those LVN programs at CNA. We need you to help build that pipeline. Um, in the state of Texas, something that's been very creative that's just starting is um, our Texas Workforce Commissioner, um, Julian Alvarez, has set aside $15 million so that we can have apprenticeships in nursing programs. So before students were doing clinicals unpaid, that was part of the whole training for a nurse. Right now, that's being redesigned so that our, our hospitals will have state resources to help do apprenticeships to move them into these fields. So it has really been all relationship building. Um, tell us how it's changed and let's figure out how we're gonna redesign this together. And um, it has really, I think, served us well. We had a big industry forum yesterday, about 800 people, and it was focused on petrochem and maritime. The demand for those jobs are there. Um, the biggest thing is how do we make sure they've got the aptitude and the skills? And then how do we help build the attitude? Um, really building a safety culture, um, time management, all those soft skills that you hear about, we're building those into the curriculum. And that, that's what we keep hearing about from our industry partners. When, um, when I hear about the demand, um, same thing I heard on that side, the retirements, our companies have about 20% to 25% of their production people are ready to retire. They want our pipeline to continue. They said, don't pull back, we're hiring. And so um, they are pretty much hiring every um, recruit that we can put out of the Petrochem. Um, it's about 95% placement. And again, at a 65,000 a year starting wage, it's pretty impressive. Uh, challenges, um, do you want, I can move to the second question, the barriers. The Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund that was provided to colleges has been amazing. Um, what we were able to do with that, um, we received about $78 million of that, about 40 million went directly into students' hands and so that they, they could finish courses. Um, we wrote off debt, you know, 
We had them retake classes if they failed that first semester of COVID. Um, we had them retake classes for free. We got additional training funds from the from Texas so that we could take people who had some college but hadn't completed and we could pay for that. So we've been able to put a lot of resources in to get people trained and, and really help support them. That's all running out. Um, and, and so as you heard about the food needs, um, we put, I have food pantries on every one of my campuses. We're distributing food. We have free cafe meals um, for students coming from our high schools who are on free and economically reduced lunches. We provide that food. Mental health counseling, um, huge resource that we're putting into place and our community partners are so important for us, making sure we've got those resources. But so much of that is, is running out and from a budgeting standpoint, um, we receive funds, some funds from the state, about 24%, and then the rest of our budget is split between taxes and tuition and fees. Uh, we haven't had a tuition and fee increase in five years. Um, we will need to have one next year. Uh, I can't sustain um, the salaries I'm having to pay and just the cost of operating without that. Property taxes have been our sustaining. I mean, our property tax revenues are, are really um, increasing. We are very, we operate very much from a conservative standpoint, um, trying to be, we realize the taxpayers are, are huge supporters of us and we need a great partnership. But I, I see tuition and fees having to increase next year. And just so you know, we're pretty economical. Um, our tuition rates are $78 a semester credit hour and $135 a semester credit hour. So you can go full time with us for less than $1,300 a semester. And um, we also have put in place, um, we had started it before COVID, but we've kept it in place and we're expanding it, is open educational resources. So we've saved our students $26 million in, um, in costs related to books because we've gone all online. And so everything we're focused on is how do we reduce costs to students but deliver an excellent product. So that's kind of the summary. Um, there's a lot happening. And I see incredible potential, but it really is how do we make, um, help people see they've got to get the skill sets to get into these jobs. Questions from my colleagues? So the, um, the partnership with industry sounds really interesting and very important. Do, do they, does industry help at all with tuition or, or apprenticeships or, or things like that? It sounds like they're quite involved in. They do. Um, on the, so one of the things is, in our industries like petrochem and maritime, I hire people from those fields. The person running my petrochemical was a plant manager retired. He's got those relationships and he's building um, those apprenticeships and those internships. Sometimes we don't use apprenticeships because it's got some you know, baggage with it at times because there's some reporting requirements and things, but we, we get creative in the model they're gonna set up. So they do, um, they do pay those. Um, they are on our campus. They're observing our, our courses. They're helping. So one of the things also, I need faculty who are up to date on practices. So um, our faculty write a paper on what they need um, assistance with, and they go out and do an externship. And industry pays for them to be back out at their plant so that they're keeping up. So the support from industry is amazing. We had a, a job fair last week for Petrochem. 33 companies came out. They're helping our students write resumes, helping them interview. Yeah. So what is your organization's uh, hypothesis about the gender differential with respect to men and women uh, mm. returning to school or your campuses or not? So one of the things that there's always a hypothesis, right? Um, so. That first year, so one of the things we did through COVID is um, we had Sanjak Cares calls and we had 600 employees calling out to be, um, our students. Those who have come back, just checking on them. Um, since that time, those, those two years, we've made over 60,000 calls. And um, it's really, they started out, we just wanna check on you, what do you need from us? Um, and at first, the males, it was more, I need to work and I can't, I can't juggle all of this. Um, and right now, it, it seems to be more the women, and it is more, I need to take care of the family. So it's all over the place. Um, 
but I've been concerned about our male enrollment for a long time. And so um, even, I mean, that's been just one of those trends that we've, we've seen. And so it is really, how do we look at, how do we better serve the male student also? Is there something they need from us? And those are the conversations we're having from them. From our parenting students and about 40% of our students have, um, our parenting students, um, they need a childcare support. So we've used, um, funds from her, we've used Perkins funds and we're paying child care for them now. Um, we used to make it where we were paying it after the fact. Well, they couldn't upfront the money, so we're paying directly to the facility. So the reasons are all over the place. And everything we keep doing is, okay, how do we put a holistic student service support in place? Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, Nancy Lamond. Nancy Lamond is responsible for advancing uh, AARP's social mission on behalf of Americans over 50 and their families. She leads uh, the federal and state advocacy work, uh, and she also oversees public education programs, community engagement, volunteer efforts, and multicultural outreach. And we have um, benefited greatly from Nancy's insights. I think she's participated in the listens. This will be her third. So welcome back, and we really appreciate your insights. So my first question, I think, is relates to our earlier discussion. Where are these two million early retirees, and what is it uh, that led them to retire that might be different than pre-pandemic, and are any of them coming back? Well, let me join the chorus of people um, thanking you all for inviting me. As you said, I've been here before, and I appreciate coming back. Um, but I want to add to it uh, the importance of these listening sessions. And um, you were one of the first to do them. And I applaud you. You know, when you get to be my age, you've been to a lot of focus groups. And you've been to a lot of sessions where you listen to people. And we had some about four months ago. And I kind of tuned in thinking, well, more of the same. And it wasn't. Women over the age of 50, women between 50 and 60. And their message was, we're just invisible. We're invisible to elected officials. We're invisible to you people in Washington. And I wish they all would just walk in my shoes. And to the extent we can, I think it's hugely important. And we, we don't acknowledge that enough. We've just launched an effort called In My Shoes, where we invited people to send a message. We got 31,000 stories within a few days. And, and I just mentioned this because Sometimes we kind of think of these sessions as not having an impact, and I know they do, and I appreciate that very much. But on to the topic you want to talk about. Um, so first off, um, it's hard to overstate how important COVID was to older Americans. We turned on the news every night and heard we were the most vulnerable. We turned on the news and saw that the majority of deaths were people who looked like me and uh, were about my age. And so all of the surveys about everybody wanting to get back to work, getting back to restaurants, et cetera, we, we were a little farther behind with that. And now um, it's a little different, but it depends on where you live. Um, and, and I can't stress that too much. I, I have a cadre of 20,000 volunteers who work with us across the country. And you get on the phone and people from some parts of the country say, why don't you just fly out here and do some events with us? We need to be out in person. And I sit there and say, I can't get my staff to come into 601 E Street, Washington, D.C., <laughs> um, you know, let alone sending them out to, uh, to South Dakota or North Dakota. So I mention this because it is the environment in, in which we're operating. And it's the environment that, um, to your question, I think produced, uh, we were a good part of the great resignation. Um, more people in the older age cohort retired early into the pandemic. Um, there were a number of reasons for that. Some was that jobs disappeared um, in industry, especially where older women were working. And so that was part of it. Second were health, direct health concerns and health risks. And I don't think that would surprise anyone. Um, third, caregiving needs. Before the pandemic, there were 48 million people in the United States who were family caregivers. And almost overnight, that number grew. And not just for the person you might have been caring for before the pandemic, but all of a sudden, especially older Americans, were taking care of their kids and their grandkids. They were teaching 
uh, as part of the remote school operation. And so all of that, I think, accelerated um, what we've called um, uh, the great early retirement boom. The fact of the matter is, and I hesitate to say this because I know you read data more carefully than I do, um, we did not see a dramatic increase in um, claims for Social Security. A little bit of an increase, not as dramatic as you would have thought given the numbers. So what we took from that was this notion that, um, that this may not be permanent, um, that it may not be a permanent step back but um, it, it's going to be very important, I think, to, to watch. Um, there is an increase of older people going back to work. Um, data shows it is not to the pre-pandemic level, but it's moving in that direction. And there are several reasons for that. Um, first is, like everyone, people have been cooped up in their homes. They're anxious to get back out. By the way, we're, way, we're seeing an uptick in volunteers as well. Uh, so not just going back to work, but trying to get back to the volunteer workforce, an awful lot of people looking to food banks and opportunities to ser serve our constituency. So we're seeing kind of more interest in, in going back to work. And of course, another factor in that is um, if you're on a fixed income or you're not working at all, um, you, need, you need to go back. And, you know, there have been a huge number of stories about how we older boomers are sitting around with all of these resources, um, trying to decide on our favorite alma mater and our favorite child to give them to. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that isn't the dominant group. About half of people over the age of 65 are living on social security. The average benefits, what, about 1,700 a month or some of their savings. So about half of people are in a situation where particularly in the current economy, they have to think about work. And so thinking about work, either going back full time or more likely part time. We all think the gig economy was invented for millennials. But the truth of it is, even before the pandemic, you saw an awful lot of older so-called retirees as Uber drivers. The fast and growing cohort of Airbnb hosts were women over the age of 55. And we'll probably see that as the pandemic recedes, um, Airbnb is starting to see more older people putting um, putting homes up. And, and I think that that will will continue. And I guess the question is, the, the great imponderable is, um, will businesses um, turn to older workers? Um, we know age discrimination is real. Uh, we do surveys all the time. We do so many surveys that I'm convinced we shouldn't do any more uh, <laughs> because they show us that most people over the age of 50 believe there's age discrimination because there is age discrimination and kind of looking for opportunities. We're meeting later this week, AARP, with the Secretary of, of Labor, um, uh, Secretary Walsh, with the leader as the mayor of, of Boston in working on behalf of, of older Bostonians. Uh, to look at the programs that are being put in place, look at apprenticeship programs to make sure that there are opportunities for older workers. And again, by older workers, we don't just mean people over 65, but over 50. Now, believing popular culture is always far ahead of us. Um, uh, you may have seen this. It circulated rather widely. King Charles, 73-year-old man, finally gets job. Uh, um, uh, it was very popular in my network. I don't know. I don't know about you, um, but um, but we really do have to continue to slug away at at age discrimination. Um, ironically, the the pandemic made organizations like ours and others work towards digital literacy among older Americans. Uh, it became necessarily if you, necessary if you wanted to get a COVID shot. And now if you've got those kinds of skills, I think it's easier to move back into the, into the labor force. And then finally, um, when I think about how people think about retirement, I always remember a New Yorker cartoon. I may have mentioned it in a previous session, which is a husband and wife standing there looking at each other. And one says to the other, you know, we'll just squeak by if we take a late retirement and an early death. <laughs> so um, my second question um, yeah. <laughs> is uh, last time you were here, we were talking about, you know, the difficulty of living, you know, on savings with low interest rates and a low inflation environment. Here we are. 
Uh, a lot of the folks you're with are on fixed incomes, um, but uh, you know you have a high inflation environment, but but also a higher interest rate environment. So just interested in hearing how are seniors uh, dealing with this uh, new environment of high inflation or interest rates? Well, it won't surprise you. Um, uh, certainly older Americans, people on fixed incomes um, are very sensitive right now to, to costs. Um, in terms of, as we talk to, to our members, um, uh, food prices are probably the highest. Uh, gas prices are still high, even though our folks probably aren't driving as much as, as others. Um, and then the third area is medical costs. And um, we've just worked for a number of years on prescription drug costs because it's what our members told us was terribly important to them. And, and we used a graphic of uh, if, um, if, if milk and bread had risen as much as prescription drug prices, uh, a loaf of bread would be $13. Uh, and it was very effective. I'm glad we got the bill through before um, anybody's <laughs> doing graphics on what things cost now. But um, but it it really cemented for us this notion that particularly if you're older, um, healthcare costs, medical costs are a far more dominant uh, factor in, in in what you're you're focused on. And I would say one of the things I've taken from this period as we've talked to our members is the ongoing concern, which will go well beyond this period we're in now, how are people gonna pay for long-term care? How are people, you know, with the nursing home situation, everybody focused on care in the home and as if that's so much easier and so much cheaper. And I think we all know it's not. And that is, I think, the abiding question um, for, for particularly older Americans and their families um, as we move ahead. Um, all right, so we're gonna uh, forego a question this time around to get Wendy in and then we'll come back if we have an extra minute um, at the end. Um, I wanna now just move to Wendy Melise. Uh, Wendy is board president for Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation, uh, which is a nonprofit in Woodburn, uh, Oregon. FHDC provides leadership for stronger and more secure families and communities through affordable housing, social services, education, and economic development. And uh, Wendy's a third generation Latina Oregonian uh, and received her BA in business administration from Eastern Oregon University. So when you welcome, um, and I want to just start with asking you what you're seeing in terms of lower income households ability to keep up with housing, uh, rent uh, payments, and other financial uh, obligations, uh, and what are the obstacles these families are facing in terms of establishing some amount of financial security? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, share the voice of our low-income um, residents across this country and certainly in Oregon and farm workers. Um, so, it is a similar story to what you're hearing. The folks are struggling. And when we talk about uh, those that before the pandemics that were barely making ends meet, and then you um, compress the pandemic, uh, they just got further and further behind. Uh, and so we're seeing very difficult choices being made by families. The, a portion of the residents that we serve, um, about half of their income is dedicated to housing. And, um, and this is a, we provide affordable housing. So uh, they are having to make very difficult choices about what they do with the rest of their wages. And we're what we consider critical, essential items in our lives, medical care, the uh, prescriptions, um, education for our children, whether that's the trades or going to community college, these are all very difficult decisions. It is, it is a, in a place where families are working, their children are working. And so it's become increasingly difficult for them. In terms of the barriers, one of the, one of the um, key barriers is certainly language. And we learned in the pandemic that uh, 
uh, communities of color were uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID. And so part of the work that we did at, at FHDC, we, we, we took a little bit of a pause in looking for land acquisition and projects. What we had to do is really provide a tremendous amount of education around healthcare and certainly COVID and resources. Um, and so language was key to that. A lot of, of, we were unprepared in that way as much as we, we would have wished that that were different, but I think um, it was a good lesson. And I think going forward, uh, those are lessons that we'll use. Um, another factor is, and I'm gonna expand a little bit about what people have been saying, we're seeing low income and middle income families struggling. So when, when we talk about it, um, I think that's really important that these are working families, uh, families with young children, multi-generational families, seniors, and, um, and we're seeing that struggle. Um, and one of the struggles is uh, when we think about ultimately in the FHCC, and I think um, in many aspects, I was at a groundbreaking lesson a month ago. It was for our Colonial Paz Community of Peace uh, it, in, in the Willamette Valley. And one of the residents, new residents, uh, spoke. And what he said is, what, what is your dream? As he just uh, moved in with his family of three. And he said, the dream is to own a home, right? And that's where we want our residents to be. And we provide, we take a holistic approach and we provide education, li financial literacy, education, um, what it takes to get a mortgage, how to maintain that. Um, and part of that is being driven because if language is a barrier, we, we really don't want them taking their kids out of school to go to the bank with them. We want them to have the information and be informed. And so um, when he said that, it really touched me because um, part of the programs that are, that are provided today have a cap on how much you can make. And, and that's a struggle for working families and saving, but then recognizing that there is so much that you can make and anything above that then disqualifies you for some really excellent uh, loan programs. And so I think that's a, that's a real opportunity for us to revisit. So access to um, down payments, loan programs. And the other two that have, because of the pandemic that we're also seeing our barriers is, and we heard a little bit about it today is, we're really working to, to part of the program has always been um, to provide them uh, connections for workforce development because they do wanna move out of uh, these um, very minimum wage jobs and they wanna, they wanna um, certainly earn more. And so really working towards stronger partnerships that serves this specific community because it, it is a little it's a little bit different um, and so I think that's one of the other areas that we'd like to see and then of course uh, health health care health care services one of the other lessons that we learned during the pandemic uh, was that the children of the families came to us and said we have a serious problem with mental health and that was something that was new to us, new to, new to, I think, across the country. And so really playing, of um, working strongly with our school districts and with other community partners to bring in the right resources for our children. Um, and uh, I think that was now an area that I think we're looking forward. We're gonna, that's an important area for us um, that we will continue to partner with. Let me just ask um, the ability of your organization to provide housing security for the families in your community. I'm sure there were challenges before the pandemic. How have those challenges changed as a result of the pandemic? Are there new challenges or do you have to face um, these challenges differently as a result of the pandemic? Well, they, they certainly have changed. One, I am, I am deeply humbled that the Federal Reserve Board of Governors wants to hear our voice. And as uh, Nancy alluded to, um, you were one of the first, and we, we now have a seat at the many tables that we didn't have before. 
And so to me, there's been an increase in two-way communication with lots of new partners. We had strong community partnerships. We've, there's many of us have been doing this work for many, many years. And, and I'm, a I'm a volunteer, um, but many of us have been, been uh, advocating um, and sharing our voice, uh, but we had new partners come to the table and new invitations. And I think that's one of the, um, what I would call silver linings of the pandemic. The challenge will be to maintain that. Um, there was tremendous uh, generosity during the pandemic. Uh, and I think echoing some of the comments earlier is how do we maintain those relationships? How do we maintain those direct channels uh, with uh, generous donors? Uh, with key partners? How do we develop new relationships that will serve our community? Because I, I think one of the lessons that we learn is when we provide the right resources and the right tools uh, that people will, we give them a hand and they will lift themselves up. And so I think that that is one of the things that came out of the pandemic so I, communication, the two-way communication, partnerships, and I, I mentioned that. The other real challenge, and I mentioned this, is we took a pause on land acquisition. We were so focused on responding that we took pause. We, we, uh, we have the same challenges in the nonprofit world in uh, retaining and recruiting. And um, so it is a thread that is, I think, fits within all of our organizations. We have dedicated, passionate individuals uh, however, uh, as a nonprofit, we cannot compete in the, with the private sector, and we certainly support our employees that want to move on, that have a better paying job and better benefits. They have families. So um, that, that was a challenge for us as well. But when we're going through this kind of pause and we're, and we're refocusing on that, we're now competing, and I, I believe someone else mentioned it, um, the construction never stopped. And it has really picked up. And so as a nonprofit, we're now competing with private developers uh, for limited space. And uh, that, that is real, that's very challenging for us in terms of the barrier that we need to overcome. Uh, in particular, because we have a, an organization like FHDC that provide is a, um, culturally specific organization, right? We're very sensitive to the residents. We, we hear from them, we, we provide these services. They have their own leadership council. There's a very holistic approach versus a private developer. Um, and what they're trying to accomplish is, is slightly, it looks slightly different than what we're trying to accomplish. So I think that's, a, that's another very significant um, barrier that we're, that we're gonna, we are dealing with today and we'll continue. I think the key to that will be the partnerships. Uh, we have uh, gained really wonderful partnerships with cities, with counties in the state, community-based organizations, school districts, utilities. I mean, there's been new partners, uh, but there's, there's still work to be done. All right, I, we might have time for one question, if any of my colleagues have a question. All right, otherwise, uh, thank you so much, and I'm gonna hand it back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you to both of our panels. This has been uh, enormously informative. And, uh, you know, we we get to spend a lot of time with data here at the Fed. But uh, I personally would say I need to hear narratives. I need to hear stories about what's really going on out there for it all to sort of make sense. And uh, so I think in that sense, we all learned a lot from you today. And we appreciate your time. And your your input is very, very important to, to the work that we all do. So we're, we're very grateful your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, team. So is that it? It looks like that is it today. All right, guys. So, hey, guys, hit that subscribe button, team. Again, I'm going to ask everybody, all 400 and plus of you right now to do me a favor. Our crypto channel has 962 subscribers. We need 38 subs. Do it now. Hit the subscribe button. Help support free trading content. We appreciate it. It's youtube.com slash beginner crypto. We will be doing a show there next week. Uh, also, guys, check out our sponsors. We got two sponsors that we promote. 
Uh, check out uh, Top Step. Top Step is a futures funded account program. This is my trading results this week on Top Step. Uh, pretty solid green week. Um, definitely happy with my results. And what Top Step does number one, there's no PDT in futures, and you can essentially trade the SPY through the E mini or the micro E mini. And so, in that way, uh, they'll give you a demo if you can hit their targets while following their rules. They'll fund you between 50 up to 150,000 with a 90% split. They're regulated by the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They pay out millions fun thousands of traders a year. They are a sponsor of our video. If you want to check them out, uh, the link is pinned to the top of the chat. You can also find it right here. Uh, the other one is stonk.tech. They are a trader social media platform. Uh, ultimately, you can you know get some free tools when they go live. They're still not live yet, but you can join the wait list. I'll consider it a favor if you do. Free dark point option flow access. Their job is to benefit retail traders for free. You can check out Stonk. More info. Again, join that link. Join the wait list. Here's the link in chat right there for that as well. I appreciate all the love and support. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, guys. Good luck. We will be back next week. As we always do, we stream every single weekday morning. My big thing here is I'm not an investment professional. I'm not an expert. I'm not a guru. I don't sell a course. Uh, and we just got to give everything out for free. We cover all the major economic releases, all the Fed meetings, uh, all the big earnings reports that you could think of. We cover CPI, PPI, jobless claims, unemployment, Fed meetings, FOMC, all that good stuff. And we cover it all for free without charging a penny. So the only thing we ask is to hit the subscribe button. We certainly appreciate everybody here. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us and have a good weekend. Y'all stay safe. We'll see you guys next week. And yeah, y'all be safe.